Uh, good morning, everybody, and welcome to the August 27, 2019 Board of Supervisors meeting. I'm gonna call the meeting to order and ask the clerk to call the roll. Good morning, Supervisor Leopold. Here. Brent. Here. Caput. Here. Versa. Here. And Chair Coonerty. Here. Thanks. Please join me in a moment of silence in the Pledge of Allegiance. Do we have any late additions to the agenda? Yes, there are some revisions. On item, uh, on the regular agenda, item eight, there's additional materials. Uh, they're revised attachments B and D, packet pages 77, 89, and 90. On the consent agenda, item 16, there's additional materials, revised attachments A and B. Uh, item 28, there's additional materials, revised attachment A. And item 40, there's an additional material revised memo packet page 515. Thank you. Great. Uh, are there any board members who would like to remove items from the consent agenda? Okay, seeing none. Uh, we will now move on to public comment. This is an opportunity for members of the public to speak to us about items that are on our consent agenda, <coughs> that are not on our agenda today, but are within <coughs> the purview of the Board of Supervisors, on our closed session agenda, and also our regular agenda if you can't stay because you have to go to work or childcare or have something else that you need to get to. So uh, please line up <coughs> if, you, if you're able and, um, and welcome and thank you. Olivia Martinez, I'm the SEIU Local 521 um, Eden Turner Organizer. Uh, hold on one hold second. Hold on. Hold on, we're just checking to make sure the microphone's on. There you go. Okay. Okay, yeah. now hold on just a second. We'll I don't need more time. Okay. It's okay. Thank okay. you. <laughs> so I just wanted to thank the leadership of Matt Machado, Steve Weisner, and Ken Entler um, for the work they've been doing with um, SEIU. We had started labor management meetings six years ago. And in the last year, even though everybody starts with some difficulty with me, <laughs> um, we've been doing some really good work, working together. They responded really well to a lot of the issues. They've been very proactive in handling a lot of the issues that we have at Public Works. So I just wanted to mention that. I think they're doing a really good job with labor relations, so thank you. Thank you, that's, you. that's nice to hear. Um, hi, Pat Malo. Um, I was just a little concerned um, that the quarterly report from the cannabis licensing officer is on the consent agenda. We've spent, I've spent, you've spent hours and hours and hours in this room um, on days where things were going better in the cannabis licensing world um, than they are right now. And we took the time to discuss that as a community. I think something that's really disturbing in this report is that it seems that the cannabis licensing is no longer focused on licensing to pay for their program, but going out and doing enforcement and collecting fines. And you know, if we had one in conjunction with the other, we might have a leg to stand on here, but it seems like folks weren't allowed to be able to get into this program. Um, it's become too burdensome and now because they can't get into this program, haven't been able to rise to the occasion, we're saying that they're unlicensed and you know not trying to get along. But we had hundreds and hundreds of registrants. We had thousands of legal businesses under your last ordinance. We had hundreds and hundreds of folks paying taxes and now we have a handful of people still with state temp or state provisional licenses now going forward and I think that there's only been a couple, if one actual license written by the cannabis licensing. Um, and I know we've all spent so much time on it. I know we all probably regret a lot of that time we've spent on it. I know I do at this point, um, but it's the system the system we tried to set up is failing right now. And so I think it deserves more than consent agenda. I don't know if it's too late to pull it, but, um, but yeah, just as a community member, I'm concerned. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> 
Good morning. Uh, my name is John Jankovitz. I'm the district fisheries biologist for the California Department of Fish and Wildlife covering Santa Cruz County. I'm here to comment on item 41 on the consent agenda, which is uh, directing the chair to write a letter of support to the state uh, Fish and Game Commission in support of the department's effort to uh, establish a low flow fishing closer for uh, steelhead fishing in Santa Cruz County. Um, essentially, uh, I'd first like to start by thanking the board for establishing this letter and uh, supporting the, the regulation change. I would like to make a few points. Uh, that what this item is that? 41. 40. Okay. Um, I'd like to make a few points that this is not a unique regulation change. Essentially, every coastal stream in California has these low flow regulations established for streams. Um, it's also not a new regulation in freshwater fishing regulations, Article 4, Section 8. Um, it determines that the department has the lawful ability to stop fishing at any time due to inadequate passage for steelhead. Um, this is simply putting a number to the books uh, for fishermen and the community to establish a good low flow fishing closure. And the goals of this closure um, is to enhance protection for the listed species in our waterways. It's also to limit the take of juvenile fish in the river. This is an adult fishery um, and during low flow conditions, there's an increased take of juveniles. Um, it's also ability to reduce wading in the stream during low flow conditions, which can disturb uh, salmon nests and steelhead nests in the system. It's also a way to simplify uh, regulations throughout the state. Again, this is kind of a, a statewide initiative and this is a small piece of that. Um, and a main point is to, to not eliminate or severely reduce fishing in Santa Cruz County. The department's very supportive of it and realizes that there's a community that is engaged in the river and wants to be out there fishing. Um, regardless of these facts, um, I'm looking for support. And so I appreciate the board's support of these measures. I also have support from the city of Santa Cruz, uh, Cal Trout, various fishing groups, and also uh, various uh, consultants that work in the river. So I just wanna express my support and clarify a few points. So thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, my name is Jim Coffis from Ben Lomond, and I'm also uh, here to speak to the uh, quarterly report from the Cannabis Licensing Office. And I was kind of pleased to see that there's a lot of numbers in that report, um, but there's so many numbers that it creates a little confusion into, into what's really going on. And so I thought I'd give you a little synopsis of my take on what those numbers mean and, and maybe uh, raise some questions about uh, what, the, what they mean. And the first one that really jumped out at me was that there's $750,390 uh, in civil fines that have been assessed uh, to date. And I'm very curious about whether or not those fines, uh, if there's any belief that any of those fines will be paid or if they're, uh, they're going to be paid. The um, a report indicates that about $19,000 has been collected in fines. I'm curious who, who paid those fines uh, and, and for what reason did they pay them? In order, did they pay them in order to stay in the uh, process or did they just pay them out of the uh, kindness of their heart? Um, the other numbers, uh, there's, there's a number of uh, charts that show actions by the CLO and the Sheriff's Office. And I, I thought I'd put those into perspective uh, because it, they keep changing all the time. We, we started with 500 or 600 registrants and then uh, went to 70 or so uh, CL, uh, letters of local authorization. And, and these are primarily uh, cultivation uh, applications. The, uh, to give you a perspective on that, today there are two um, provisional licenses in Santa Cruz County uh, in the unincorporated area for cultivation. Now, uh, 
Santa Barbara County has 867. Uh, Humboldt has 765. Mendocino has 340. Uh, Monterey has 350. Uh, Trinity has 119. Uh, Santa Cruz, the total county, including Watsonville and, and the city of Santa Cruz has 24. So, you know, Santa Cruz uh, is way, way behind in terms of production capacity uh, compared to the rest of the state. And so that doesn't bode well for the future uh, of either the uh, economic stability of the cannabis trade locally or tax revenue. Thank you. Before you start the clock, I've asked two supervisors to pull an item from the consent agenda. Supervisor McPherson, would you pull item 77 from the consent agenda? The, the supervisors already had their opportunity to pull items. That was, that was item number four on our agenda and they, no one chose to. So uh, now's your opportunity to speak to those items. All right, Supervisor Caput, are you willing to pull 77? I, I, I protest this process because when in the agenda is the public able to ask the supervisors, you've already closed that book. And um, this is a new change to your policy. As a public citizen, I don't think it's working well. So um, item 77 has to do with Lompico Road delaying by almost two and a half months a repair authorization. After um, in the San Jose Mercury News, it was uh, shown on front page that uh, Lompico is number one at risk during fire evacuations. I would like to see this county step up to the plate and expedite that repair rather than delay it by two and a half months. I think it's a critical issue and should be discussed other than just an item on the consent. Can you stop the clock, please? Well, hold on just a second. Yeah. So, so Ms. Steinbrenner, first of all, as you mentioned, you asked two supervisors to do it. Right. Both supervisors had an opportunity. They chose not to do it. You've also had a back and forth via email with our public works director about about this item where he answered your questions and explained the reasons why it's taking time. So All right. at this point, I, I think it's best if you wanna just speak to this item or whatever items you want. All right, I'll speak to the item. Thank you very much. And thank you, uh, Supervisor Caput for yeah, giving I, I believe it's deferred anyway, right? It, it, it says to return uh, direct staff. Uh, I did look at it November uh, 5th. Uh, but the issue is that it's being delayed. And the issue, did you all get the, co thank you, Supervisor Caput, did you all get the copy of the article that from the San Jose Mercury News that I brought to your office? Ms. Ritter was kind enough to make you each a copy. In this article, it says Lompico is number one in all of the 23 Bay Area cities, localities that were studied by streetlight data analysis did a nationwide an analysis triggered by the problems at the, the campfire. Lompico is number one in the Bay Area that is the only one in Santa Cruz County that was identified in this study. I think it is negligent of the county to delay any repairs on this road. There would be over 2,000 residents, according to people who live there, that could be trapped, that could be a repeat of the campfire. If you choose to delay this repair today, to me it says that you are uh, willing to accept the liability should there be a wildland fire and a devastating evacuation occur, that you are negligent because you have delayed by choice to get this repair expedited. I'm just putting that on the record. And it's astonishing to me as a rural dweller that you would do this. I understand there's paperwork problems, but I also understand that the county has on contract a consultant to handle the paperwork. I also understand the county has on contract five engineers to do this work with all of these storm repairs. So I don't think that claiming there's a problem with paperwork that requires a two and a half to month, month delay is, um, I think it needs questioning. And I have communicated with Mr. Machado and I don't agree at all. Well, I'm out of time. I just want to quickly say that uh, 172, Proposition 172 money needs to be allocated. We were going to talk about a CSA 48 increase. According to Mr. Frank's article, it's not here, but 
Thank you. Your time's up. Thank you. Good morning, board. <clears throat> My name is Robert Holdridge. I provided some documents to uh, each of you last Thursday. Did you receive them to your offices? Mr. Friend? And did you? Well, that's all right. I can, I can turn it up. I delivered some documents to you last Thursday. Did you receive them? Do you agree that's a, address, a matter that should be addressed? Perhaps not in this venue, but certainly addressed? Do you have any agreement at all? It's a Facebook posting. Regarding <clears throat> matter of public safety, do you want to address this issue now or can we address it in the future? Anybody? Sir, sir, this is a time for you to Anybody, speak. Anybody, do you want, I would like the matter put on, put on agenda then. Sir. Are, are you willing to put that matter on agenda in the future? This is a time for are you, you to speak willing, to us. I, are I'm you willing gonna, to? Sir, I'm not gonna engage in a back and forth with you. Right now, this is your time to speak to us okay. about whatever items right. you want. Okay, that are within I, our it's program. not on the agenda, but some items, documents I provided to you. Are you willing to put that on the agenda for a future meeting? Or you cannot respond. Thank you very much. It's a matter of a uh, Facebook post where it deals with a clock and a bushmaster, someone who was known in the county. It's just a matter of public safety. I was just thinking that maybe we could avoid a potential disaster. Sir, I'm going to have to ask you to leave. Thank you. I'm going to leave. Hi, my name is Brent Harrison. I'm not really sure how this works, but I'm sure most of you know that um, the rainforest is on fire. And I was hoping that each uh, district could plant like a minimum of 100 new trees just to stand in solidarity with the rainforest. Right. That's all. Thanks. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Is there anyone else who would like to speak to us about public comment on public comment? All right. I will close public comment and bring it back to the board. There is. Okay. This will be our final speaker. Off the bus where I had an interesting conversation with a, a disabled man who had worked with a PG&E subcontractor cutting the trees and he described this tree falling, a horrible, poor guy. Um, another one of PG&E's uh, disasters. Um, I'm, <clears throat> let me see. I've been here many times, hundreds of times about the dangers of microwave radiation sources that are just uh, proliferating here and ask you to take appropriate action to protect the public from this known harm. And so far it's fallen on deaf ears as the radiation contamination increases and increases. And uh, you can see it with these detection meters and um, the evidence is overwhelming. So I really don't understand how people think their children and future generations and the birds and the bees and everything is going to survive this microwave onslaught. I gave you copies of 5G apocalypse, the extinction event. I hope you've watched that very well substantiated. And it starts out, it's important to understand what 5G is doing and what they say it's doing. We're told on the IEEE beam forming document that um, Electrical Engineers Association, that this technology cooks your eyes like eggs in World War II. We all need to understand these are military weapons. These are assault frequencies. If you know nothing else, more than that, that's what you need to know. It's, next page, microwave radiation warfare. That's what it is. And I asked you to also sign on the document called 
appeal to stop 5G on Earth and in space to have everyone try to stop this because uh, we're in big trouble. And I want to invite you to this and anyone else who wants a flyer. There's an expert from the Karolinska Institute in Sweden, Olli Johansson, who's speaking on EMFs, electromagnetic frequency and health. Where do we have, where do we stand? Adverse health effects of modern artificial electromagnetic fields, cell towers, cell phones, Wi-Fi. Please attend this and someone from your health department. Very serious, thank you. Thank you. Here you go, Ryan. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to say on uh, 33 and 77, the key word is defer. That it's being deferred till November and uh, we are looking at it. So it's not like we're making a final decision right here. So that's a, I just want to make that comment. <coughs> sure. So, uh, so we've concluded public comment and now it's an opportunity for members of the board uh, to speak about items 16 through 81 before we take action. And Supervisor Caput, is there, are there other, do you have any other additional comments you'd like to make about the consent agenda? I'm, all, I'm okay. Okay. Supervisor Marcus. Yeah, I have uh, several here that I would like to, about the can cannabis licensing. <laughs> cannabis licensing operation. Uh, progress has been slow, as we all know, has been mentioned. Uh, but I appreciate the efforts that our, our cannabis licensing operations uh, have done to date. I, I hope that we can speed up the process. Uh, there were predictions that this would be going to be a big money maker, uh, among other things, but uh, it hasn't been realized yet. Uh, we are putting a lot of resources into this and will continue to do so. I think we need to really get with it, as was mentioned. Um, I just would like to ask um, or um, Sam Laforte, if uh, about when, when do you, the the negative aspect of the monetary situation here, um, do you, when do you see, do you have a good uh, horizon, what's in the horizon for uh, when our, the tables might be turning on this? Um, I think the cannabis licensing office uh, currently, we're looking at about two years out um, to see our license uh, fees continue to increase. And the reason it's uh, such a long projection is because once a use permit is approved, um, oftentimes there are build out and infrastructure improvements that need to be made in order for the site to become operational. Um, some people who have gone through the use permit process are projecting between nine and 15 months to make those improvements before they can become operational. So that's why I think that that two year time period um, is realistic. And then um, one thing to take note of is the cannabis licensing office is funded based on licensing fees and administrative costs associated with running the program that are recoverable fees um, and not based on cannabis business taxes. Cannabis business taxes go directly into the general fund. Last year we had our operational expenses were $1.3 million and cannabis business taxes totaled uh, just over 3.4 million. So we were able to intake 800, nearly $900,000 in, in cost recovery and licensing fees. So overall, the, the program costs just over $400,000 to the general fund, but cannabis business taxes did contribute over 3.4 million to the fund. Okay, that clarifies it some, and I hope we can continue to move forward and. Uh, and uh, realize the, the benefits that we, we have projected and we accommodate those who are interested in the business. So thank you for your efforts. Thank you. Uh, also, and the, um, it was mentioned about the low fishing letter. Uh, I'd like to thank Supervisor Friend for working with my office and the county staff uh, to write this letter and uh, finalizing the low, fish, uh, uh, low fishing restrictions. Uh, so as the letter states, these restrictions uh, will create some predictability of anglers rather than subject, subject them to longer closures. And um, I'm glad we have their support in this effort, as was mentioned. And, um, and, and I support this uh, request that we're making to the state. Um, on items number 51 and two, um, there's nothing specific, but I would like to, if there's a representative from the district attorney's office, this is, uh, 
to give us a sense about uh, the biggest challenges that we're f facing right now, now in uh, fighting fraud, is there somebody from the district attorney's office here that could just give me an update, uh, Mr. Atkinson, um, if um, there's, there's all kinds of fraud, unbelievable in some respects sometimes, but uh, I'd like to know just how we're addressing this and how big of a problem is it in Santa Cruz County? Well, as you know, the price of real estate continues to skyrocket in Santa Cruz County, and it becomes one of the most uh, viable sources for criminals to access funds from elderly people and suspecting people, uh, people who are desperate to do something to try and either save their homes or take care of other pressing bills. We're part of a real estate fraud task force, Tri-County, between Monterey and San Benito. We meet quarterly and discuss types of scams that are occurring throughout the Monterey Bay area affecting real estate. There continue to be a number of scammers trying to outright file fraudulent documents taking people's property. Uh, elder financial abuse plays into it when relatives or, or uh, siblings try and drain equity. Um, we receive referrals from state agencies, local county agencies. There has been, if anything, an uptick on the number of referrals and cases that our office has been handling. If um, somebody has a problem or a suspicious, can you just give us a, basic, a, a phone number so they might be able to call your office or whoever is the right person? Certainly, they can call our main number, 454-2400, and ask for our Consumer Protection Department. They can uh, go online and get one of our complaint forms, fill it out, email it in, and upon receipt, we'll either send it off to the real estate uh, department and or initiate a response ourselves. I want to thank the district attorney's office for uh, keeping their eye on the ball in this and just a, a forewarning to others that are out there. Uh, this is going on in our community and uh, we, we need to be uh, protect the community as best we can. And I, I just want to encourage them, uh, anybody that's watching or listening to this, that uh, if they have a suspicious activity of this type and fraud, that they, uh, they address it and uh, get, to get to your office. A absolutely. It's happening we're, here. We're open for business. We've even got the recorder's office sending us suspicious recordings. Okay, I don't, Mr. Allen, did you want to have a, a quick statement too? Uh, only that we are working actively on these types of uh, white collar frauds that uh, really plague this community. And, uh, you know, and I think we've obtained well over a million dollars in restitution for victims. So uh, I do think it's an important area. Good. Thank you, thank you for your comments. Um, I just wanted to mention on item number 51 re regarding the San Margarita Basin. I, this last week or this week, I took a tour of um, the the basin. Uh, Mr. Ricker led the, uh, the charge and uh, it is amazing how complicated and intertwined our water system is. And, uh, and it's Santa Margarita and Mid County have uh, studies going on as we speak that uh, were demanded by the state, but they're, they're very necessary. And I just want to give a, a positive shout out to the people of Santa Cruz County and their conservation efforts over the years. Uh, we, I think it, it was mentioned that uh, an average in the Santa Cruz City water system, at least, uh, who was involved in that. Uh, tour, I think it was uh, the average home uh, used 43 or 47 gallons a day. It's one of the lowest in the state, if not the lowest. And uh, thank heavens we've been doing that historically. And we're, aside from the, uh, the wet winter we just went through last year, um, it's good that we did that and we, we keep our eye on the ball and uh, and that. So I just uh, wanted to thank uh, those who were associated with that tour. Uh, very informational, and uh, the people of Santa Cruz County are gonna be very um, very pleased if we come up with a, a legitimate plan that they understand and uh, the reasons why we're doing that. It's, it's absolutely necessary. So um, then I just wanted to mention one, a couple other things on the item number 60, the Homeless um, Persons Health Project. I wanna thank all of the nurses and uh, the great work that they do in our community. It's a tough job that uh, de demands a lot of skill and, um, and sensitivity. And I'm grateful that we have a med medically assisted treatment uh, team that uh, services in our community uh, that have um, 
that uh, unfortunately our community they use an alternative heroin as their, their drug. We know that substance abuse is um, both a common cause and a, and a reason, a result of homelessness that we have is projected probably a third of the homeless have a substance abuse problem. Uh, but I'd like to reiterate how important I think it is that we be able to track how many of these uh, medically assisted treatment um, clients come to treatment through our syringe services program and Narcan, Narcan uh, outreach. Uh, we've, um, as the HS, HPHP mobile clinic pr program is developed, I, I'd be asking, uh, I know and they know this is coming, about any plans the health services agency uh, has to incorporate uh, the syringe services program. As I said before, we, we will need to work closely with the community to uh, when we're deciding what to do in that, that regard. On um, item 77 and 78, in particular, the uh, Lompico project, uh, I hear from residents um, about what is taking so long to repair our storm damage that uh, this county suffered in the 2016-17 floods half of the road damages in the state of California. We have a lot of catching up to do, and I want to commend our public works department for doing as much as they can. Um, and uh, we're, we're delaying the ratification of two contracts that was mentioned. I'm well aware of that. I read that in the front page of the Sentinel about Long Pico Road. Um, we, we all know about the, the change in the federal reimbursements as well. And I'd like to ask uh, Public Works if it will um, to provide any additional information about the delay. I think it deserves a response of some type that was made uh, to the questions that we have here and the reasons why we're doing it. I think it's self-explanatory, but on the other hand, it's just a necessary situation that we have under the circumstances. Uh, I don't know, Mr. Machado, if you might just want to talk about, just to give us a brief explanation of that, which you have done to uh, Ms. Steinbrenner and the board as well. Sure, absolutely. Uh, good morning, Matt Machado, Director of Public Works. On both of those deferrals, uh, we are putting contracts together. We did receive bids. And uh, the delay though was really due to Federal Highways giving us authorization to advertise. So the delay happened some time ago. Uh, we had these queued up on the calendar early on, but because the delayed advertisement, it's also delays our award. Uh, we're working hard, we're working with contractors to get bonds and insurance in place so we could bring a complete package to your board for approval of those contracts. Um, so it's certainly no delay on the county's part. Uh, and then the delay that did happen happened some time ago with Federal Highways authorization to advertise. I also comment that there's a number of other projects on your agenda today where we're accepting improvements that are complete. Uh, there's two projects that are going out to bid, storm damage projects, so there's a lot moving forward and uh, our staff is working hard. Okay, thank you, it's, it's understandable. Um, I wanna thank you for that and then the, the work on the Bear Creek, that's uh, another road slip out that's been completed and uh, took a drive up back uh, Bear Creek Road and um, it really looks good, so thank you very much. Um, and se finally, the uh, on item number 79, the Felton Library naming, I'd like to thank the donors of uh, those who have given to the Felton Library that resulted in these naming opportunities. Um, I had a chance to tour the construction site. It's gonna be fantastic and I can't wait to see the library open uh, probably late January. That is all, Mr. Chairman. Great, thank <laughs> you. All right, uh, Supervisor Leopold. Uh, good morning, Chair. Uh, I just have a couple uh, items to comment on. On item number 30, which is a cannabis licensing office operations report, I appreciate getting this information. The statistics in here are helpful. Um, and you know, this board has said we're interested in figuring out how to get to 75 licenses over this next year. Um, there, there has been progress made towards that and why uh, we see the, you know, one cannabis license, it represents the possibility for 23 others who have to complete the process without doing the land use portion. So that can be achieved rather, relatively quickly. We also have a number of people who are in the process. Um, and uh, I think uh, in my conversations with the CLO staff, they're working, doing everything they can uh, to move that along. Uh, they have to work with our planning department uh, and work with uh, licensees, uh, some of which are new to the land use process. So I appreciate the work of the CLO uh, uh, and I look forward to continuing getting these reports and seeing our, uh, us advance. I also think that we have uh, 
compliance or enforcement activities that are an important part. Uh, we read all the time about uh, the growth of the black market as well as the regulated market. Um, and in order for the uh, the legalized market to work, we do need to do enforcement actions against those uh, who are operating illegally. Uh, and it shouldn't overshadow uh, what we're doing, uh, but it's an important part of creating the legalized market here in Santa Cruz County. It is also uh, good to hear uh, when we look about the difference between where we are in terms of license fees. Um, it, it's unfortunate to take two years, but to know that there's another three million dollars in taxes that we would not be receiving if we had if we did not have a legalized uh, cannabis uh, program. Uh, that's uh, that's good uh, to the bottom line of the county of Santa Cruz, and I appreciate the work of everyone uh, to help make that happen. Um, on item number forty, I just want to encourage the adoption of a resolution in support of Assembly Bill two sixty two. This is a bill that already passed about the Buy a Clean California Act. Uh, which is an uh, 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 important way in which we uh, look at the greenhouse gas emission from the products that the state of California buys. Uh, the, in 2021, they have to put this into uh, effect. Uh, and uh, the Sierra Club and other organizations are moving forward, uh, trying to encourage the state to not move the deadline, uh, but uh, start uh, collecting this admission information uh, about products so we know what, what we're buying is actually not contributing uh, to destruction of our climate. On item number 60, which is the uh, report on the Homeless Persons Health Project, I, I like to say this is a very powerful report. Uh, uh, of an organization that's working on the front line of a crisis in which we have in our community. We'll be hearing from another uh, organization uh, shortly, uh, but when you look at the information that's included in this report about the increase in the number of people taking uh, medication-assisted treatment, uh, which is one of our goals in our strategic plan, uh, it's, there's a dramatic increase. When you look at the number of people who've been, who've been moved into permanent supportive housing, it's an impressive statistic. This is what uh, community is asking for us to address. How to deal with the, uh, use, the, the rise of drug use uh, and its impact on the community. Uh, how do we move people into housing so they can stay there? Um, these, the Homeless Persons Health Project is out there on the front lines making this happen. And I, uh, and I uh, just wanna recognize all the people who do that work. It's pretty incredible. On item number 71, I'll just thank the Public Works Department uh, for their work on the Glen Haven Road uh, storm damage uh, project. This is an important project uh, for uh, folks in SoCal. They've been waiting for this uh, repair to be done and I'm glad to see this moving forward. Uh, lastly, on item 79, I too wanna thank the donors who are helping the Live Oak Library happen. We're a little bit uh, 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 behind where Felton is, uh, but I'm looking forward to a great library annex in Live Oak uh, uh, in the coming uh, days. So thank you for the work of the library to make that happen. That's it. Supervisor Friend. Uh, good morning, thank you, Chair. I'd just like to uh, thank Supervisor McPherson and staff regarding item 41 and the board's support uh, of our letter to the commission. I'd also like to acknowledge health services on item 57, which I think that that grant is pretty remarkable for uh, a mobile mental health team for the South County. I think that that'll do great things for uh, the South County specifically for the children and youth in South County. You know, there are a lot of items uh, from 63, 64, 65, 66 that are all uh, grants through human services that show some of the breadth of what the county does. Uh, just like to thank human services. Sometimes these things just go through quickly, uh, but realistically there are remarkable programs behind this on, on uh, housing support services, on food and nutrition services, on educational other benefit services uh, from our local partners, but also the leadership of human services uh, can't be understated on some of these programs. These are millions of dollars that are going to help the most needy in our community. And as we saw recently, as one of the highest poverty rates in the state when you factor in cost of living. One of the key takeaways from that study from the Public Policy Institute of California was that without these safety net programs, that number would be even higher. Uh, and that work is being led by human services. So I appreciate your work for our community and the voices that aren't often heard here at the board meeting. Thank you. Real, uh, if I may. Yeah, I, uh, I just wanted to welcome um, 
the people that have uh, volunteered to be on various commissions in Santa Cruz County, Michael McGannon, Nancy Cole, Christina Granados, and Edward Mendoza. Uh, they've all volunteered to be on various uh, commissions in the county. We get a lot of public input, a lot of public discussion through people that have um, actually stepped forward and are volunteering their time to be on these various commissions. We, we all listen to people that we have on commissions. We get a lot of public input and we get a lot of information from them. So I wanna thank them and welcome them uh, to be uh, on their various commissions. Thank you. Thank you. And I just have a couple comments uh, to make. So one is on item number 30, which is the cannabis licensing. Um, I share the concerns and one of the ways that we uh, monitor and improve process is by getting these numbers. Um, and uh, just because we don't hold a full public hearing doesn't mean that we're not all asking a lot of questions about how to move it forward because we do want to support the small businesses uh, that are trying to get up and going and get licensed in our county. And it, it has taken too long and uh, we're hopeful, I'm hopeful that we uh, have improved processes enough in order to, um, in order to, to get people up and, up and operating legally. Uh, on item number 58, I'd like to defer that item to the next meeting, which is the, this is the Medi-Cal um, uh, uh, substance abuse uh, report. Um, and uh, just because I haven't had a chance to meet with the HSA leadership and get my questions answered, so defer this to our next meeting on uh, September 10th. Uh, and finally, on item number 66, which is the Human, Service, uh, Human Services Department, um, CalWORKs Long-Term Economic Well-Being Programs. I think these are just really exciting and look at uh, new ways to track long-term success of people who are engaged in CalWORKs uh, in a way that I, we haven't done before and and support uh, performance um, in those programs. And so I want to commend the HSD department for, uh, for moving a project like that forward. So uh, at this time, I will now uh, entertain a motion on the consent agenda. I would move the consent agenda as amended with the uh, deferral of our sure. 58. Defer, deferring 58. Deferring 58 to our I'll next I'll second meeting. that part. Okay, so motion by Leopold, second by Caput. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, that passes unanimously. Uh, I, uh, I'll make a quick comment too. If you look at the consent agenda, 95 uh, to 96% of them say approve, accept, approve, accept. About 4% say defer. Defer means we're gonna look at it further before we actually say approve or accept. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, so now we're going to move on to item number seven. This is a presentation by uh, Derry Gashorn of the executive director of the Homeless uh, Garden Project. And uh, we're excited to, to welcome you today. Good morning. I'm Kathy Kelfo. I'm the president of the board of directors of the Homeless Garden Project. And I'm here with Derry Ganshorn, who's the executive director. Um, we're here happily to update you on the project and our move to Poganip. This is a vision that the project and the entire community have had for the past 20 years since the city per first included a permanent home from the Homeless Garden Project in the master plan for Poganip. We see homelessness all around us. You're talking about it this morning. And we know thousands of people in Santa Cruz County are homeless. We also know at the Homeless Garden Project that we can do something about it. There are a lot of causes of homelessness, but joblessness, which the project works to address, is the number one cause. Providing someone with a job, housing assistance, substance abuse counseling, and mental health services can and does prevent homelessness. Derry's gonna to talk to you a little bit about the project and the work that we do and the incredible results that the Homeless Garden Project is having here in Santa Cruz. Hello, good morning. The project provides job training in the form of paid transitional employment, along with support services. <clears throat> our trainees work in all aspects of our organic farm workshop and retail operation. Our 12 month program can serve up to 17 trainees at a time currently. 
at Poganip over time, that will expand to 50 trainees. Program participants are connected to housing, legal and health services, and one-on-one -on -one social support for accomplishing goals. The program also plays an important role in connecting homeless men and women to the thousands of community volunteers who participate in our program each year. Last year, we had 2, 000, nearly 2,500 volunteers at the project. We also connect um, our trainees to growing food for those in need in the community. More than 7,000 pounds are distributed by the project through nonprofit partnerships with groups such as Transition Age Youth, Santa Cruz AIDS Project, Homeless Persons Health Project, Davenport Resource Center, and more. Last year, 100% of Homeless Garden Project graduates secured permanent jobs and 100% moved into housing. That is why we're really excited about the move to Poganip and the opportunities that we'll have there to engage more homeless men and women and members of the public in our program. We announced a public goal, fundraising goal for the capital campaign to build a permanent home at Poganip just a few weeks ago of $3.5 million. And we're proud to be able to share with you today that we've already raised 3.2 million of that, which is a huge community accomplishment. Uh, one that I don't think we even thought <laughs> we would be successful at doing when we first started. Um, We've been through the city process. We have permits and are ready to start construction. In January, as you may know, construction was stopped temporarily while the city and the county investigate some potential impacts of skeet shooting that took place on the property back in the 1940s. Uh, we're optimistic. Thank you for your support, Supervisor McPherson. Poganip is in your district. Um, that with your support, these issues will be resolved soon and that we'll be farming at Poganip by 2021, that's our goal. Just a quick look at the map of Poganip. We'll be farming initially three acres, about the same amount of land that we're farming now at Natural, Natural Bridges Farm in Santa Cruz. We'll be constructing a parking lot, which you can see on the map, that will allow more visitor access to Poganip for hiking and other uses, as well as for volunteering at the project. There will also be two greenhouses, a barn, and some administrative offices. It'll be the first time in its history that the Homeless Garden Project has had bathrooms and electricity on its site, so uh, big things. The farm will be very much in character with the history of the site. It's been designed carefully to minimize visual impacts. We will be growing organic vegetables, fruits, herbs, and flowers, and our new farm will have orchards. One of our core values is to be good stewards of the land, and at Poganup, we will be restoring coastal terrace prairie habitat. I wanna close by thanking you for valuing the work that we do. I'd like to introduce our graduate, Karen Chappelle, who will speak about her time in our program. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Karen Chappelle, and I'm here this morning to share with you what a transformative and inspirational place the Homeless Garden Project is for so many people in this community. Under the leadership of our executive director, Derry Ganshorn, a dedicated team of caring and qualified staff, interns and volunteers work together with people like myself who need to find their way out of homelessness. I began working for the Homeless Garden Project in July of 2018. Before I arrived there, I was basically unemployable. My background report was such that it prevented me from getting a job with many employers or keeping a job once the report came back from the state. So on the recommendation of a friend, I went to the Homeless Garden Project farm to apply. The process is an intuitive one. They ask that you spend a day working with them to learn about the program, to see if the work is something that you were able and willing to do. 
what I came to understand is that this orientation includes the idea that we, as trainees, make an investment in our own lives and futures, as well as an investment in the lives of others through the organic food that we grow. I spent several days and found joy and satisfaction in planting seedlings, weeding, and harvesting mature vegetables, flowers, and strawberries for our CSA clients. I was hired soon after and had a great year, have had a great year there, growing organic food and flowers as well as growing on the inside and becoming a whole person again. My self-esteem that had been shattered by my homeless experience was restored, my confidence built with each passing season. My trust in the new relationships that I built brought me back from the edge of despair to being a part of a vibrant and dynamic family called the Homeless Garden Project. The biggest lesson for me, however, was that I was valued and valuable as a human being. I had somehow lost that understanding in my journey through homelessness. It had been so long since I felt connected with the community that I was overwhelmed with relief and gratitude and renewed hope. I still have moments during the day where I stop and give thanks for my good fortune in finding and connecting with the Homeless Garden Project. One of our greatest assets at the farm are the volunteers that are recruited and organized by our volunteer coordinator. I was so touched by people in this community who came out to the farm to support our project and to meet us so that they could understand homelessness better and take the stigma and fear away from the word. I worked alongside many people that I would not have met otherwise, and they got to know and appreciate me as a person, truly an invaluable gift after having experienced so much rejection and prejudice from ignorant or abusive people. I feel so much stronger now than I have before and have future plans for myself that I know I can make happen now that I have such a strong support system. I've obtained a second job and I'm working on average 50 hours per week. I was hired into a permanent position as a workshop production assistant at HGP so that I can continue to invest in this meaningful project and give what I have received to future trainees. I am still homeless, but I'm working closely with my housing navigator at Front Street Housing because now I can afford to consistently pay rent. Thank you for your time and attention. I hope that you give this project the support that it so richly deserves, having been a part of the solution for homelessness since 1990. Thank you, and thank you for coming out today and sharing your story. Uh, so thank you all, thank you for that presentation. It's a beautiful project in so many different ways, uh, physically and in the way it creates connections and meanings in people's lives and opportunity. Uh, now's an opportunity for members of the public to speak to us about this item if they wish. Marilyn Garrett, I want to thank Terry for all of her decades of work with the Homeless Garden Project and say, I've known her for a long time since your kids were toddlers. Was that like about 30 years ago now, close to 30 years ago? So I'm very appreciative of your work and uh, thank you for your very moving testimony. And I, I, I've said this before, but I think of this bumper sticker that says it'll be a great day when the schools have all the money they need and the Air Force has to have a bake sale to buy a bomber. And I would say, it'll be a great day when the parks and um, housing, and we have everything we need to have a, a viable community and people who are housed and fed if the military isn't siphoning off 50% of our money for killing people in other countries. So it's, it's a bigger picture. I'm glad there's this effort to help the homeless, but we really need to have a larger effort. I'd like to see the county say, the tax money that's going to the federal government for military, you can't take it anymore. Have the League of Cities or the county governments stop this kind of robbery and theft from the, the community here. So, um, and, and I'd like to see, you know, one thing that troubles me a little is that, you know, it's on parkland or hiking areas. It's a great project. I'd like to see some of these big developments that are taking place instead of those, like the Aptos Village project, where I'd love to see this kind of project there. So thank you again for your work. Thank you. 
Good morning, board members. Ellen Timberlake, director of the Human Services Department. I just want to, on behalf of our department, acknowledge and appreciate the leadership and the work that you've done all of these years. Sharing your story, um, it's very impactful. And I want to just say that we will be here. We are here to support your expansion through the CalFresh Employment Training Program. You already are participating in that. But as you move to serve, move from 17 to 50, we will be there supporting you because the outcomes that you're producing already are, are amazing. And we look forward to helping you as you um, expand. So thank you. And thank you so much for sharing your personal journey. Thank you, Becky Steinbrenner, resident of rural Aptos. Thank you for your good work. Um, I have taken um, my homeschool groups to the homeless garden and we've worked in the garden and we've talked with the, the people there and it, it, was a, it is a magical place. And I'm hoping that that magic transfers up to the new site as well. There's something amazing about being at the edge of the continent, looking out over the sea as you work in the garden. And I'm hoping that the wonderful views up in Poganip will also be inspirational. Thank you for sharing your story, Ms. Chappelle. That's very, very brave of you and I appreciate you very much. I think um, this project speaks a lot to the value of getting people out in fresh air and working in the earth. And I know that your, your board and different agencies are also working to do a project similar like this to, uh, or similar to this with a juvenile uh, uh, re, I don't know what you call it, juvenile hall. Um, because there's a lot of value. People, people, a lot of people are lost and, and Ms. Chappelle, you said it so well that you felt valued as a human being. And when you can connect with people on a common ground, working in the ground, working with animals, it's a very healing thing that I think a lot of parts of our society have lost. As we have moved from an agrarian society to a high technology society, a lot of people are lost. And getting their hands in the earth is a very grounding thing and it supports a community. One of the wonderful things that the Homeless Garden Project does for its volunteers is brings them all together and we all have lunch together with everyone. And that is uh, an amazing experience and again supports the community. I will miss the great meadow up in Poganip. <laughs> I've gone for walks in the moonlight with our school kids again and it is a magical place too. So I'm hoping that there can be some restoration. Um, I guess that's all. I just am very supportive of this project. I wanna thank you and um, hope that it does happen and is carried through with the magic that the site on, on the Swanton Road has had, or Swift. Thank you. Thank you. All right, that concludes public comment and thank you all for coming out and sharing your story and information about this exciting project today. Really appreciate it. Uh, 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 Chair, I just wanna just, uh, uh, say that it's, um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, how uh, we do our work with a, a homeless <clears throat> homeless population is uh, something in which our constituents ask us about on a regular basis. And the, to see the success of the Homeless Garden Project uh, and what it's done and how it's helped people individually, your story was incredibly powerful. Um, and to hear that you have 100% uh, who are uh, in treatment or in housing, um, th those are incredible uh, uh, statistics. Uh, and is there anything else that we could be doing here at the County of Santa Cruz to be able to support the development of, uh, uh, of this new site um, in the Poganip? Should I go up there? Yeah. Yes, please. The most important thing to us is to get the study that's currently being done on the site by County Environmental Health done expeditiously so we have some answers about that space. Obviously, we don't want to be there if there's a contamination or an issue that would prevent us from doing so, but we've talked to a lot of experts and our thinking right now is that if we move expeditiously, at least three acres of that land will be cleared so we can start farming by next year.
And that's how you can help us is staying on top of that process. You know, sometimes everyone who's working on it isn't aware of how important this is to people's lives like you heard today. So if you could just keep reminding everyone as they do their work that we really appreciate the time that they're spending evaluating the site and we need them to just give us an answer as soon as they possibly can. Thanks. It seems like a reasonable request and to hear that you've uh, already raised $3.2 million of your $3.5 million goal is, is uh, saying that the community is strongly in support of this project. Uh, so to our environmental health uh, department, I hope we can move uh, quickly on this uh, so we can get shovels on the ground uh, and turning the earth till we can produce great organic vegetables for the, all the community to enjoy. Thank you for your work. I, I just don't know how, how you can uh, describe winter, but you've, uh, you've got it all. I mean, self-esteem, um, the, the healthy, educational, it's all wrapped into a package. And when you go out and, and visit and tour this site, it is phenomenal. How energized everybody is, and I thank you, Karen, for your testimony. I know there are a lot of more people that have that same feeling. So just want to say what a great project this is, and uh, wish you well, and we'll do what we can. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you for your work. Uh, we're now going to move on to item number eight, which is a public hearing to consider a resolution amending the general plan, local coastal program, land use element, noise element, circulation element, and public safety element, and accept the CEQA determination notice of exemption, consider ordinance amending Santa Cruz County Code chapters 13.10, 13.12, to create an airport combining zone district and to rezone properties within two miles of the Watsonville Municipal Airport to be included within the combining district ordinance creating a new chapter 13.15 noise planning and ordinance amending chapter 16.01 environmental review and schedule uh, the three ordinances for final adoption on September 10th 2019 as outlined in a memorandum of the planning director mr. Carlson are you here to present today thank you chair um, this this project involves updating several parts of the general plan and the county code addressing land use near the Watsonville Community Airport, noise and environmental review. The airport updates also um, involve updates to the county's local coastal program because the updates involve uh, rezoning properties in the coastal zone. <coughs> it's fine. Okay. <coughs> yeah. Uh, the first planning commission public Oh, here we go, okay. Uh, the first Planning Commission public hearing on the project occurred in October 2018 with several, several years of work preceding that. Staff worked with the Watsonville Pilots Association on the airport land use planning updates and with the noise consultant on the noise element updates. At the public hearing in March 2019, the Planning Commission recommended the Board of Supervisors approve the project, which at that time included a much more extensive uh, update of the safety element. Uh, the project was scheduled for public hearing before the board in June 2019 and staff requested and the board approved deferring the public hearing and separating the project into two separate independent projects to be considered on two separate public hearing dates. Uh, so today's public hearing addresses the issues regarding the airport noise and the uh, county's environmental review guidelines. Policies addressing safety and noise in the unincorporated uh, area around the Watsonville uh, Municipal Airport would be updated and consolidated in the land use element. This involves relocating policies addressing air travel from the circulation element to the land use element. And Santa Cruz County Code Chapter 13.12 would be amended to implement the updated policies and establish the airport combining zone district as a new zoning overlay on properties near the airport. The noise policies and the safety element would be moved uh, to a standalone noise element. A new Santa Cruz County Code Chapter 13.15 noise planning would implement the policies of the noise element. And finally, um, County Code Chapter 1601 would be amended to establish the county's environmental review guidelines would be the most recent version of CEQA and the state CEQA guidelines as they may, may be amended in the future. Uh, so uh, first addressing the airport, um, the Watsonville Municipal Airport is located within the city of Watsonville, shown by the shaded area, uh, but is mostly surrounded by unincorporated county area outside of, of that shaded area. 
Uh, the goal of airport land use compatibility planning is for the airport and surrounding land uses to coexist. Surrounding land uses should not constrain airport operations or create unacceptable safety hazards. Guidelines exist for how to accomplish land use compatibility around the airport. The California State Aeronautics Act requires Caltrans Division of Aeronautics to create an airport land use planning handbook that contains the essential elements for airport land use compatibility planning purposes. And under the State Aeronautics Act, the county has no discretion with respect to the handbook's criteria. Um, as confirmed by the State Appellate Court, the act requires the county to incorporate in the general plan and county code the height, land use, noise, safety, and density criteria that are compatible with airport operations. Uh, one of the first steps is to establish the airport influence area, which is defined in the act as all the lands within two miles of the airport boundaries. This image uh, shows the city limits indicated by the, th the thick black and white dashed line and all the shaded parcels outside the city limits in the unincorporated county area are located within the airport influence area. These are the parcels that would be rezoned by adding the airport combining zone district designation on top of the existing zoning uh, without changing the existing underlying zoning designations of the parcels. The additional zoning designation would trigger application of the airport compatibility policies when reviewing development projects on those parcels. Uh, this is the map of the safety zones that, uh, zones that have been established around the airport runways. Uh, the county code would be amended to either allow or prohibit certain land uses in each of these zones based on the different levels of risk in each of the zones. In each zone, the density standards for residential uses and intensity standards for non-residential uses would be either the standards that apply to the safety zone according to the handbook or the underlying standard according to the current general plan and zoning designation, whichever is stricter. Uh, in general, the urbanized areas near the airport, um, the density standards of the safety zones are stricter. However, once you move out to the agricultural lands further away from the airport, the density standards in the county's general plan become uh, stricter. And according to the handbook, these safety zones do not prevent the construction of a single family dwelling and an ADU on an existing parcel. Uh, this is a map of noise levels around the airport runways and flight paths showing uh, relative noise levels along the typical takeoff and landing loop. Uh, to meet the building code requirement for interior <laughs> sound levels projects located within the 60 to 65 decibel contour line would be checked during the plan review process to verify proper sound insulating construction um, in the home. Uh, however, all parcels within the airport influence area from the map we saw previously would be required to record a statement of acknowledgement regarding, regarding airport noise on the property deed as a condition of issuance of a building permit uh, for a new house or expansion of an existing house. Uh, the noise level standards are in both the airport land use policies and repeated in the noise element and the new noise planning ordinance, um, which will be discussed uh, in a moment. These are maps of air airspace protection service surfaces that uh, should be left free of obstruction, such as tall objects and trees to prevent hazards to flight. Uh, the map on the right shows the contours of the airspace protection services above the airport and the map on the left shows where these imaginary surfaces intersect with existing objects like trees and power poles around the runways shown by the red shading and the actual ground surface in the hills northwest of the airport shown by that um, large reddish shaded area. Uh, the proposed code amendments in chapter 13.12 include an equation for checking proposed structures to determine if um, FAA notification is required. And the FAA then determines if the structure would present a hazard to flight and if the hazards can be mitigated or not. Um, a correction to the equation is required, however, in a revised packet, page 77, was provided showing the correction um, and another correction to preserve the county's ability to require lowering or removal of um, overheight trees. And so in summary, um, the new section, a new section would be added to the land use element, section 2.25, airport land use compatibility. And this is provided <coughs> in exhibit B of attachment A. Air travel policies would be relocated from the circulation element to the airport section of the land use element. 
Um, other amendments will be made to the rail <coughs> section of the circula circulation element um, as well. Um, this is provided in Exhibit C of Attachment A with a strike through underlined version provided in Attachment H. New requirements would apply in the airport influence area, the safety zones, noise impact areas, and to prevent hazards to navigation. Um, an existing county code chapter 13.12 would be updated and renamed the airport combining zone district to implement the policies and rezone the properties. Uh, this is provided in attachment B with a strike through version provided in attachment C. Uh, so that completes the airport uh, third of the project. Uh, moving to noise, um, the second part of the uh, project involves the creation of a new noise element by moving the noise policies out of the safety element. The new noise element contains extensive background information about noise and the county's approach to noise control. Um, it does not substantially change any existing noise policies or standards, but um, adds some additional mapping um, as shown here and uh, policies to be consistent with state general plan guidelines uh, for noise elements. The new noise contour maps um, like the one shown here will facilitate compliance with state building code standards uh, for sound insulation in new buildings located in areas of excessive noise, similar to what I just explained regarding airport um, noise. To better implement the noise element, the project would also create a new noise planning ordinance for the main purpose of reviewing development projects for compliance with noise standards. The existing noise ordinance in chapter 8.3 of the county code would continue to be reviewed used primarily by the sheriff's department to respond to complaints of offensive noise. Uh, the new noise ordinance includes a list of exemptions and some new requirements. Um, it establishes hours for construction activity um, and exempts emergency work of various types and agricultural activities, for example. The various noise standards in the noise element and the ordinance reflect the different ways that noise uh, can be measured and how noise is perceived. Noise can be measured directly at any moment in time in decibels, and this measurement um, can be adjusted or A-weighted to account for the limit, limited range of the human ear, um, and this would be considered a ma uh, maximum or, or instantaneous noise level. Uh, noise measurements can be taken over time and averaged by the hour, um, and this is sometimes re this is referred to as the hour, you know, hourly um, LEQ standard. You see that abbreviation um, in, the, in the ordinance. Or over a 24 hour period by uh, weighting the nighttime noise more than the daytime noise to account for different sensitivities uh, to noise at different times of day. That's referred to as the day night level average. And you see that abbreviation um, throughout the um, general plan and noise uh, ordinance. Um, or noise data can be measured to show how often over a certain period of time noise levels exceed a certain standard, um, like the L25 standard, and that uh, refers to, uh, to a situation where noise can exceed a certain standard for more than 15 minutes of any hour, for example. Um, and the perception of new noise sources can vary depending on existing ambient levels of noise. If existing ambient levels or noise are low, then a new noise source, no, new noise source will would be perceived as a greater impact uh, compared to the same noise source if existing ambient levels were um, already relatively high. And the ordinance accounts for this with slightly different criteria to address uh, each of those situations. Um, and for the first time, the ordinance includes noise standards for mechanical units such as generators and air conditioners. When operating these units, um, these, these units produce consistent noise levels, so an appropriate measurement would be to measure the maximum level in just straight decibels without averaging or adjusting over time. Um, a correction was made in the ordinance for the sound level for emergency generators to add the abbreviation for decibels, uh, but why, what might be more appropriate would be to, to delete the existing abbreviation <coughs> for day-night level average on that standard. Um, so that the standard just becomes maximum level, similar to, similar to the existing standard for HVAC units in the ordinance. Um, I understand this is complicated. Um, it's a complicated subject, and so hopefully I can answer any questions that come up um, after I'm, I'm done here. Um, the new noise element is provided in Exhibit D of Attachment A, and the new noise ordinance is provided in a, um, um, an Attachment D of the staff report. And then finally, the third part of the project um, aligns the county's environmental review guidelines with the most current version of state law and CEQA guidelines. 
local procedures for appeals and EIR consultant consulting uh, contracting would be provided by existing sections of county code and the procedures manual. Um, the amended ordinance, chapter 16.01, establishing the county CEQA guidelines is provided in attachment E with an underlined strike through version provided in attachment F. And then um, finally, the staff is recommending that the board conduct a public hearing to consider the proposed amendments to the general plan, local coastal program and the Santa Cruz County Code. Affirm that the pro proposed amendments are exempt from CEQA and the exemption is provided in exhibit A of attachment A and adopt the resolution amending the general plan and local coastal program and directing staff to submit the lo <sighs> local coastal program amendments to the California Coastal Commission for certification and approve the ordinances amending the county code and local coastal implementation plan and rezoning properties to add the airport combining zone district in concept and direct the clerk of the board to place the ordinances on the next scheduled board of supervisors meeting agenda for second reading and final adoption. And that concludes my presentation. Great. Now I'll take questions from members of the board. Supervisor Prem. Uh, thank you, Chair. I do have a, a couple of questions. I appreciate uh, since this falls, the majority of this falls in my district, a little bit with Supervisor Caput. Uh, regarding, the, in essence, the sound insulation or the standard for interior noise exposure, mm -hmm. what would trigger it? When you trigger this, uh, if there's not a new construction, for example, what you said is in a, um, an expansion of the home or a remodel, but what's the percentage? I mean, if somebody's coming in, they're getting a deck permit, the, the termites or whatever it may be had. Um, is that triggering, in essence, that we're putting a new requirement on them from a construction within the home? Or is it that you are adding a certain amount of square footage to the home that triggers it? I didn't notice a specific trigger percentage. Uh, my understanding is it would, be, it would be triggered if it was a construction project that involved an addition to the home that you had to insulate. And so the, the, it's the sound insulation standards that would kick in. For the entire home or just the area that you're building? No, not for the, you wouldn't have to re-insulate the entire home. It would just be the, the portion that you were, um, constructing new. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and so these disclosures would now be required of realtors at the point of sale as well as for any building permit at all? You, you mean the deed recordation so, so you, requirement you, in the airport influence area? You would have to sign an, a, um, I had read that you would have to, uh, that you would have to acknowledge and accept the impacts that may occur due to overflights over the time at the time of sale and as a requirement of receiving a building permit. So in essence, this is a new disclosure that would be added onto these homes as well as in order to just simply receive a building permit from the county, you'd have to acknowledge this? Yes, you would have to make that acknowledgement um, upon issuance of a building permit for a new home or expansion of an existing home. Yes. And so for those two specific purposes again, because a building permit could be for something other than that, so. Yeah, it's, water yeah it specifies in the code, right. that language, new home or expansion of existing home. Okay, not, not a new deck or replacing your windows or something like that. Okay, and this is, it's helpful for me because it made it seem like I was creating, we've been in the process of trying to streamline the permit process and the thought that you'd come in for a new water heater as my college, as my colleague mentioned, seemed a little bit onerous, but if that's not the case, it's specific for that. So the, I guess then the, the ultimate, um, impact, so to speak, on homeowners in the greater area would be the lack of ability for potential future land divisions, although that in and of itself through uh, Measure J strikes me as unlikely anyway. So is there really any kind of, and also it was probably preferred by the neighbors in that area that there wouldn't be additional land divisions. So is that how you would read into yeah. the, the impacts? Yes, that, that doesn't present a big impact because of our existing land use scheme in that area, but it actually has had an impact on one land division that I know of that okay. uh, could not move forward because it was located in a safety zone, which had stricter density criteria than the underlying um, existing zoning. So that was withdrawn. But it strikes me that there's limited discretion as far as the board is concerned based on the handbook and litigation that's sort of driving this from at least the Watsonville side. Is that a correct statement? Um, Wait, let me make sure I understand the question. Can you, can you repeat it? In essence, this is being, we're incorporating things that we're required to incorporate into yes. the code. Okay. Yes. I mean, I think it's important uh, in general for the community to know it's not being driven specifically by board action of, as far as putting additional restrictions on people's homes. This is uh, something that has gone through an extensive process 
and challenge uh, throughout uh, both Watsonville and others over the course of the last decade plus. And so that what we're doing is incorporating things that we're required to incorporate in and the language itself doesn't seem to have a lot of uh, discretion as far as how it comes in. Yes, exactly. Okay. There was some not, no, there was some unclarity, I guess, um, prior to that appellate court decision that uh, <clears throat> mandated that we incorporate these requirements in our general plan without discretion. And my last question just deals with uh, obstructions or other hazards to flight. Obviously, we have a lot of property owners that do have trees that, that uh, need to be addressed. This is something I appreciate that Mr. Williams uh, has been addressing on behalf of uh, the airport. Uh, but what would the actual process be then for us doing notifications or requiring people moving forward uh, through this new ordinance? Um, this new change. My understanding is there is an existing process ongoing right now but, uh, in collaboration between the county and the city and property owners to lower or remove some trees. And I understand our code enforcement division is involved with that as well. Um, however, I, I don't know all the details on how that is playing out. Well, that, that's correct. I'm wondering what this would change moving forward as far as, um, I mean, some have already been trimmed. There's already been some that have been addressed, but moving forward, this seems to create something that is much more specific than had previously existed within the code. And so I'm asking what functionally would change five years from now, you determine there's an obstruction within the approach. Uh, how would it, how would we address Probably it differently? Probably wouldn't change the approach. We're, we're trying to preserve the, the, the ability to maintain the existing approach that we have to require property owners to lower or remove the overheight trees. Okay. Through the language in the ordinance. I may have additional questions. I appreciate that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Supervisor Leopold. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you for the presentation. These are two uh, somewhat complicated subjects um, that, uh, that actually uh, are really two different things. Uh, and I appreciate uh, the questioning from my uh, colleague about the Watsonville Airport. Um, I think that's an important issue. It's an important county resource. Um, and we should re reflect what we're required to as part of the state handbook. Uh, and I, and I, I, I emailed a question or two to you about that. I won't go into that uh, uh, very much. I appreciate the work. The noise ordinance, however, is a big change and it doesn't just affect the folks in South County, it's a countywide ordinance. Mm -hmm. And I would have preferred if we'd had this as a separate item just to talk about this, because this is, this is a big change in some ways. Um, uh, and so it's concerning to me. Um, the, uh, we, get, we, we all get, or at least I could say I get, uh, uh, lots of calls about concerns about the noise of neighbors, construction, um, uh, HVAC systems, um, in part because the commercial areas in my district uh, immediately adjoin residential areas. There isn't really a downtown, it's, there is a commercial area and then the house is literally right behind it. Uh, single family neighborhoods. And so there's a lot of conflicts. So <clears throat> when I read in the staff report that we were gonna have a more comprehensive look at, at that, I thought, well, that's good. But what I saw on the ordinance, I'm not sure um, um, made things better. Or in some cases I could argue made, it could make things worse. And, and so I wanna talk about that because uh, um, I have concerns uh, about it. Uh, for example, um, on the new 13.15.040, uh, uh, which is on page 89 of our board packet, um, it talks about construction activities happening between the hours of 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. That is uh, somewhat alarming to me because uh, while we don't have anything about construction noise in our uh, ordinance now, we do have a noise ordinance that basically says quieter till 8 a.m. and after 10 p.m. So when I see that now, and, and, and I get calls when the trucks start showing up at 7.30 um, and they're idling and they're making a lot of noise and, and everything else. Um, and so when I see this at 7 a.m., I see that as a big expansion um, of uh, the number of hours noise and the trucks will start showing up at 6.30. Um, my number's in the phone book, uh, so I'll still get those calls. Um, they'll just be coming a lot earlier uh, the, uh, than before. And uh, I'm not exactly sure what the drive is to go to 7 a.m. I mean, that's, that's uh, 
Uh, I haven't seen a public outcry for that. I'm also concerned about the 7 p.m. Uh, piece because uh, I think people like to see that work done, uh, you know, if it's gonna be in their neighborhood while they're at work. And then when they come home, they have some peace and quiet. And so I'm, uh, I'm concerned about these hours and I think it's more appropriate to think about construction noise between eight and five. I'm also, um, one of the other uh, complaints that we get a lot in our office is the number of days in which people are doing construction. And so um, here we're proposed six days a week, uh, possibility of a seventh. Um, and you know, people understand that, that things are gonna be built, uh, but they, they generally need some relief. You know, they're looking for peace and quiet in their home. And uh, well, as we see a lot of infill development, these, uh, these issues become uh, greater. And I'm gonna, I, I, I'd like to propose us taking a look at the language here uh, to change it to something that's, 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 that might be more amenable. Uh, in section C of this uh, exemption piece, it talks about entertainment or special events. This is, I'm, I'm very concerned about uh, because this seems to be opening up a wide door to activities um, that we're now saying are okay that before we might have required a special permit for. So when we say um, that uh, these, these rules do not apply to reasonable sounds emanating from authorized school bands, school athletics, school entertainment events, you know, those, that, that, that might fall in, uh, into something. But when you talk about occasional public and private outdoor or indoor gatherings, community events, public dances, shows, bands, sporting and entertainment events conducted between eight and 10, it seemed like now you're saying that's now okay. We don't have to get a permit for it. It's it's a uh, it's um, it's permitted, and I think that's a slippery slope to create creating a lot of problems. And I was uh, when I was looking at a comprehensive ordinance, I was thinking that we might want to have a little bit more meat on there to know when people need to get a permit and, and know when they don't. If 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 I'm having a birthday party at my house and and, and, and uh, I have a little music, okay, that's a once a year activity. Maybe it's on a, on a milestone birthday. But when you talk uh, about um, someone who wants to do some commercial activities or whatever else, um, it can become a real nuisance uh, because things like occasional is ill-defined and um, you know, your occasional, it might be my uh, regular. Right, and I just, I'm, I'm worried about this language that's in here. Um, likewise, it was confusing to me uh, then uh, when we got to uh, 13.15.050 that we had these things where um, uh, the general noise regulation on lawful noise, and then we had this reference to other parts of the codes with other things that you know weren't referenced, it's, it seemed odd to me uh, uh, to have that piece in there as well. Um, when it comes to things like uh, 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 HVAC systems, uh, this is this is also a big issue uh, in where the commercial areas adjoin uh, the residential areas. And if we're going to do something about it, let's. Let, let's be uh, a little bit more thoughtful of it. I'll just give you an example. The, the Point Market in Pleasure Point has a compressor on its roof that is, is less than 50 feet away from the bedroom of the house next door. Our current rules allow that compressor to go on at 6 a.m. Um, and they put baffling around it, but the people who live behind it will never forgive us. Um, and for good reason. It's a, it's, 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 right now it's, it's legal to do that. Um, and if we're going to if we're going to try to have a comprehensive noise ordinance, it'd be nice to figure out how uh, what we can do to protect those um, those interfaces of the commercial and residential areas uh, to protect against HVAC system. That HVAC system could have been placed in a different location that would have been less impactful. It was just cheaper to put where it, where it is, and it's legal to put where it is. And so. Um, 
if we try to push these on the commercial side rather than the residential side, if we require a certain kind of sound baffling um, uh, for residences or at least bedrooms that are close to uh, the, the uh, machinery, um, we'll get better development and we'll, we'll, uh, we'll not drive people on edge uh, the entire time. So to me, that's an example where um, I think we could use some better language um, about it. Uh, the, the, um, the other uh, piece is the general plan uh, amendments. Um, and there's some new language and there's new language both in the ordinance about rail noise and in the general plan about rail facilities. Generally, I don't have an issue with the language. Um, however, uh, I am uh, concerned that we're in a public process right now of which the five of us are involved in around doing an alternative analysis about the use of the rail corridor that may or may not be rail. And so I'm wondering if we adopt this today what would be the process if after the alternative analysis said that we choose bus? Will we have to change our general plan to, to, to do that? And, and what would it take to do that? Maybe that's not a question for you, Mr. Carlson. Maybe it's a question for our attorneys. Um, I, I don't, we committed to a public process and I wanna honor that public process. So Jason Heath County Council, we don't own that property. It's owned by the RTC. So this is a planning document. And we're saying what we're doing in the general plan amendments that we're talking about is we're supportive of these, of these things. And basically my understanding of the rail facilities language is that they were basically just trying to update it. And the planning director may have some supplemental on this, but I don't believe that we would have to change what's in the plan, in the general plan, because we, we currently don't have control over it. If there was a if there was a decision made by the RTC to do something else with that property, that would be done. Does that make sense? No, I, I get that. Okay. I, I just, we, we seem to be weighing in on, on one version of what these, this alternative analysis is gonna be looking at. And so uh, to the extent that we may not make that as a choice, um, what would it take to change that language in here? Well, what it would take would be to come back and, and, and do what we're doing right now and hold a public hearing and change it to, to amend it back. And, it, and I, I'm, I totally get what you're saying about that. I'm sensitive to that issue. And maybe we can hear from the planning director on what her intention was with these changes. Kathy Malloy, Planning Director. Yeah, the existing um, rail policies, we tried not to change the intent of those. So where there were already policies in our general plan that said support rail planning and recreational use and potential for passenger rail and all that stuff, that's already in our ordinance. So we didn't feel like we should change um, the policy whatsoever. We just tried to update references that you know, because it was last written in 1994, and so some of the terminology and references were outdated. Um, and, and it would be a pretty straightforward thing. Our intention is always to reflect what decisions are being made at RTC. So if by the time, for instance, that we come and we approve a new circulation element, and we know better, you know, what's going on with rail now, we can always bring a change back to this and make sure it all stays internally consistent. Yeah, I just, I, I think it's, in, it's super important to honor the public process in which we've Absolutely. committed to. And I, yeah. I just wanna make sure that we aren't backing into something that, um, that uh, would somehow predetermine what that conclusion is, yeah. becomes important. If you did want me to, to provide any other information on some of your other comments on the noise ordinance, I sure, could do that I'd be as happy well. To do that. Okay. Um, in terms of uh, section 1315040, the exemptions for entertainment or special events, uh, the eight to 10 is our current noise ordinance in terms of offensive or nuisance noise. And that's what the sheriff you know, frequently responds to when there's loud parties that exceed 10 p.m. So it's kind of consistent with, it's accommodating our very existing approach. And then at the end of that section C, where it talks about where there might be the potential for a commercial special event or a temporary use permit or, or what have you, that type of noise, it says, as long as any applicable requirements for special events permits or temporary use permits are met. So it's not, 
providing um, a license, if you will, just through adoption of this code for those types of things to occur and to create noise. It, it very directly links it to um, a use permit or a special event permit. So that was the intent there. And then the 050, where it talks about, it gives you some references to other code sections. Um, those are just existing code sections that relate to noise generated um, attached to land use, and so we wanted to cross-reference it. And then the air conditioning and mechanical units, that's a, a brand new provision in, in large measure because of you know the experience that get, go on in your districts with residential close to, to commercial and some recent uses. So this is the first time that we have a noise standard for adjacent mechanical equipment. And it says that for existing units adopted, you know, units installed before the date of adoption of this ordinance, it's a 60 dB no threshold. And in the future, it would be held to a 55, which is a, a lower than, than existing type standard. Yeah, so I, uh, I appreciate that. Uh, a couple things that I would say is, one is if we're gonna have what we call a comprehensive noise ordinance, it'd be nice if we looked at it comprehensively and didn't just uh, put, in, put down in writing what it is we already do, because we have section 8.3, and if the sheriff is, is doing section 8.3, um, you know, the, the question remains, what is it we doing? This event piece, uh, to me, uh, could give people the impression that they, they don't have to get permits because it's, it's a principally permitted use if they only do it occasionally. And I think it, it creates confusion rather than clarity uh, in a noise ordinance. On the question of the mechanical units, um, to me, it would be helpful for us to also talk about um, uh, uh, placement of these units, um, uh, uh, um, uh, taking into consideration if there's a bedroom that's on, that's that's on the the same plane as the uh, as the units because these this is where the conflicts happen, and so I think we could we could sharpen uh, this language and actually get something that will work. As I said, and and that point that I made about the market, they could have put it on an, on on the front side of the building. It would have been tremendously less impactful, um, but we didn't require it. It was less expensive to put it in the back and. As a result, we just have a, a terrible problem that will never go away for the people who live there. So I'd, I'd like to see that language changed. Um, I think those were my uh, uh, primary issues and I'm hoping that the board will, um, uh, that we can direct the, the, the staff to go and work on the language in a couple of these sections. Uh, I'm hoping that on the seven to seven piece for construction that's really eight to five that we um, that would that we, we allow uh, weekend days but not more than three consecutive that we that, that the idea of getting permission to make sure that it's uh, that someone's thought about this instead of just giving a blanket exception makes a lot more sense um, to me and I think it'll make a lot more it'll, it'll be a lot more acceptable to the community. Uh, uh, Mr. Good Caput, or, oh, excuse me. Yeah, just good questions, and um, many of which I had too. Um, I do think the time time frame is, is one that needs to be addressed. But just in follow up, is there is there any county requirement that we're making that is <clears throat> more strict than the state code in general? Um, Regarding yeah, anything, in, yeah, in, anything, but and in particular, noise is a, is a big thing. But, would, but that's been kind of gone through. But uh. no, what we're we're trying to be consistent with the state's general plan guidelines. Mm -hmm. okay. um, they don't. The guidelines don't set, you know, specific mandatory standards. Um, but we are adopting the state. standards that are consistent with those guidelines and not necessarily stricter or okay. less strict. Okay. <coughs> Supervisor Kevin. You bet. Uh, <coughs> well, I'll start it off real quick with, what, what is the motivation be, uh, behind having this here uh, for us to discuss it? Is it to make, is it because of future development? Uh, or is it uh, people in the area 
uh, is that com uh, you know com uh, neighborhood complaints. Uh, what I'm getting at is we do have a state handbook and we have rules and regulations. Are we making changes because of complaints coming in, which I, I used to have that area before redistricting uh, came in and it'll probably change. Now it's in district two, but I did have that whole neighborhood. Is it, a plan, is it because of future plans in the Buena Vista area? that uh, developers have been looking at. I, I, I'm trying to get an idea where the, why we're discussing changes right here. We are required by existing state law to incorporate the standards in the handbook into our general plan and county code. So that is the basic requirement. This is existing state law. And um, that existing state law and some handbook standards are all, have already and are all and are already being applied in some cases because they are existing and do apply. Um, what brought it to more urgency of, was the history of uh, the um, interaction between the Watsonville Pilots Association and the city of Watsonville and the court case and the appellate court decision which um, established that we were required to incorporate the standards in the handbook without discretion and use the most strict standards in the handbook. Right, and, I, and when, I, when I did have that area, I heard very few complaints about you know noise and things like that, because people who bought near an airport knew that planes were gonna be taking off and landing. There always were a few people that would complain, but uh, it, uh, yes, again- there are existing real estate disclosure laws that require realtors to be disclosing that information yeah. during those transactions, which is outside of our process. And it was brought up by uh, Supervisor Leopold about the hours, 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. I didn't catch that in here. Are we making it more restrictive on the airport or are we making it more lenient? Uh, the construction hours don't apply to the airport. Those would apply to building per projects that are being done under um, county issued building permits. And so would, those would establish hours for okay. those construction activities. Yeah, uh, because the airport has been cooperative uh, in many ways uh, with the neighborhood. And uh, they did work it out with the school district uh, in the safety zones, uh, landing and all that. That, uh, that I do appreciate. Uh, but I, I, I'm really worried. I don't want to, uh, uh, we, we've approved, uh, yeah, the city council also in Watsonville approved the extension of the north-south uh, runway by about 700 feet. Uh, that was supposed to, have been, uh, supposed to have been done about eight years ago. It hasn't been done. Is what we're do, looking at here, is that gonna restrict that extension of the runway because it does talk about runways here? No, in fact, the maps that I showed do incorporate that potential expansion. The safety zone maps and the airport influence area, uh, the, the, the safety zone maps do incorporate that potential expansion. Okay, I, I mean, I, I'd like to see that runway uh, extended because that would allow for, um, uh, it would be a, a big uh, help to, uh, for the safety concerns of taking off and landings. So I, that is not gonna be affected by anything we're doing here. No, in fact, we're planning for it. Okay. And then uh, um, safety zones, motivation. Uh, when we're talking about uh, noise levels, uh, we, it's mentioned in there, animal habitat and all that, but also the number one concern, I guess, is the, uh, the landowners and the residential areas. So uh, is this related in any way to what was proposed a few years ago, the Buena Vista project, which would be about uh, developers who were looking at that land near the airport to build up to uh, 3,000 homes. Does anybody, can anybody fill me in? Is that part of the motivation of this whole thing? Well, uh, Measure U 
uh, which was approved in 2002, yes. incorporated the Buena Vista area into the city of Watsonville's sphere of influence. And after that, there was an attempt to develop a specific plan which resulted in a lawsuit over the general plan in which the court ordered these changes to be made. So that this is, uh, we're incorporating the changes that the courts ordered to be made to protect the airport protection flight uh, safety right. zones. Okay, so we're not, this is not, uh, this is not to make it easier for developers what we're talking about on that Buena Vista project. No, this is uh, incorporating the results of the appellate court decision oh, right. on the general plan. And, and uh, upholding uh, state regulations and everything in the handbook. Right, that's okay. correct. Okay, that's, uh, I just want to make that clear. So, um, and the last, uh, it says contour maps. How do, how do we, uh, a contour map uh, do the contours change? We're talking about buildings or are we talking about land contours? In the case of the noise levels and the airspace protection services, surfaces, we're talking about lines of equal elevation or equal noise levels. And those change as you move away from the airport. So that's why you see lines of right. equal noise levels changing as you move away from the airport. And the, the airspace protection service surfaces essentially create sort of a bowl shape above the airport and then the right. landing zones down to the runways. And those are line, those lines on that map are lines of equal elevation of those imaginary surfaces in the air space above the airport. You bet. And I'll, I'll sum it up here. Uh, I'm very much in favor of protecting our airport. I mean, uh, it's a, a lifeline to the community of, uh, the, of all of Santa Cruz County. Uh, we go back to the earthquake in 1989. There was really only one way to get in uh, personnel here, and it was the Watsonville Airport. Uh, when we had the tra trabbing fires, trabing fires, in the county about eight years ago. Uh, the uh, firefighters were staging and using the airport. National Guard was using the airport also. So at the other end, the other thing that I'm looking at is they, they are trying to be a good neighbor. And I understand um, too much noise would be... Uh, uh, bad and uh, all we have to do is look at the uh, changing of, of course, the San Jose and Oakland, San Francisco uh, flight path changes over uh, the Santa Cruz Mountain area. We don't want that. We're not talking about that. We're talking about a local airport that we need to protect and also work it out with the neighbors so that both sides are. Uh, you know, okay, like they did with the uh, Pajaro Valley High School. They worked that out just by changing and moving things a, a little bit away from the uh, uh, runways and the safety zones. Okay, thank you. Okay, now it's an opportunity for members of the public to speak to us about this item. If you're interested, please come forward. Um, hi, my name is Tina Cho, and I just wanted to mention about the timing for the noise ordinance for the construction. I'm just concerned about the construction workers themselves, like especially in the summertime, it gets really, really hot in the afternoon, and construction workers have to wear full gear head to toe. And um, a lot of construction is done in the earlier hours of the morning for that reason in the summertime. So I just want you to consider that maybe that's a possibility. And that's also the same thing with um, construction workers who um, work like on Highway 9, I noticed during the really hot days we had a couple of weeks ago, they started working at night because it was just too hot during the day. So just um, don't forget about the workers themselves. And that's my only comment. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Becky Steinbrunner. I'm a resident of Aptos, but I'm an, also a part of ARIES, the Amateur Radio Emergency Services Communication Group. And I wanna thank you um, uh, 
Supervisor Caput for really driving home that it is important that we keep this airport here and functioning. And I think that putting in the code and requiring real estate agents to make disclosures is a wise move. Um, just a couple of days ago in the San Jose Mercury News, there's a big discussion about the Reed Hillview Airport and the, the problems there. And I really want this airport to stay. I think it's a lifeline for our community as it was 30 years ago in uh, the 1989 earthquake. Um, I do not see any communication in your binder from any members of the public or from the Pilots Association. I'm happy to see Mr. Rayvon Williams here in, in the audience, and I hope that he will speak to you. Um, I think that the Watsonville Airport does a good job in trying to work with neighbors, and above all, I really want this airport to stay there and functioning. Supervisor Leopold, I want to thank you for your very thoughtful analysis of the countywide ordinance that this also brings in and the um, concerns about extending construction hours. Um, in the Aptos Village project, that was addressed by uh, limiting the hours that the construction crews could be there and weekend construction was not allowed at all. It wasn't always enforced, but it was not supposed to be allowed. So um, thank you for that careful analysis, and I look forward to seeing this coming back with some of the reworks that you've asked for. Thank you very much. Marilyn Garrett, noise and safety. Those are uh, key issues, of course. Um, I wanna talk about my personal connection to that area. And I think it was in the map. I taught for years at um, Calabasas School. And many of my children lived in the area near the airport. And uh, noise is uh, definitely a, a problem, but there are other problems um, that are not I think need to be incorporated here. Whenever I see exemption from California Environmental Quality Act, I think um, it really needs to be examined. What are the environmental impacts of the airport? And while I do agree, it's important to keep the airport there. Uh, some of the key problems I see are with the, um, talk about safety. Microwave radiation from all the radar is not safe. It's harmful. And here, you know, I have this detector of radiation. Marilyn, Ms. Garrett. I, this, excuse me. Let me have the, my have, three minutes. No, no, I'm talking speak, about safety. But you're not talking about noise, which is I'm the topic yes, of this I am. item. So I'm please talking, talk about noise. Okay, I'll incorporate noise into it. You can hear radar and that's why alan frey a neurologist this is people hear what they think is tinnitus they think they have tinnitus it's microwave hearing and there's a lot of noise from that at the airport as well and so why are you talking about noise and safety but you don't want me to talk about safety and the elephant in the room that you don't look at i have friends who live off hames road the radar from the airport on the detector, and we had an electrician come, pulsing, pulsing, every time the radar comes around at the airport. And the film you received called Take Back Your Power shows the effect on the insects with this pulsing radar. It's, it's very dangerous. And also, a friend has a letter of someone who lives near the airport who, figured out why he had insomnia, headaches, dizziness, the symptoms of microwave sickness caused by radar and, and, and microwave exposure. This is a safety issue. It's not safe. And there's also the firefighters' symptoms from exposure to the antennas were like they were in a brain fog. Noise. How good is it, it for a pilot to be in a brain fog 
caused by this radiation exposure. Not safe. Okay, uh, that concludes public comment. I'll bring it back to the board. Supervisor Leopold. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, I do want to appreciate the work that the staff put in uh, to these changes. Um, and I'm, I have a question for um, council as to whether there's a way to break off the airport piece and so we could be completed with that and leave the, uh, the, the noise uh, uh, piece uh, to, to, for some work, Ordinance 13.15. Yeah, th there, there is. This, this, this is a complicated matter. It involves four things, I think, that have been identified. It sounds like the board may be wanting to excise one of those matters for the moment. And so if you were interested in crafting a motion, what I would in that, are you interested in Yes, I'm, I'm, that's, I'm, I'm asking for help in the, okay. in the direction so of, the, of, the, do, of doing the, it. The suggestion would be to adopt all of staff recommendations other than three things, which would be adoption of chapter 3.15, noise planning, chapter nine, noise element of the general plan, LCP, and three, amendment of the GPLCP safety element to delete the existing noise policies. So essentially it would be a motion to adopt all staff recommendations other than... What was the third one again? The third one was amendment of the GPLCP safety element to delete the existing noise policies. That was a recommendation that was done in conjunction with adoption of a new chapter nine noise element of the GPLCP. And so it sounds to me like you're wanting to excise all of those actions from the staff recommendation uh, for further work. Yes. And, um, and um, as an option, I don't think there would be any problem in just deferring the whole package. So, you know, the resolution addresses everything at once and it might just be less work to, to be honest with you to just defer it all and make the changes um, needed because um, we're not going to submit this stuff to the Coastal Commission anyway. And they're, they're kind of intertwined a bit in terms of where s language is, is coming and going from and, and all that. Well, uh, I'm, I want to, I think there's a broad support on this board for the airport piece. I don't think there's any disagreement yeah. with that. And so uh, I don't want to create more staff time. I want to focus on the areas in which I think there are legitimate concerns in the noise element. And if, and if the department would, de would prefer us to defer this, um, uh, I I'm happy to do that uh, th with a couple of suggestions of things. I think, to be honest with you, it would be preferable, but because to create the documents that extract things and separate things out is just is more housekeeping work, um, and and it would be in a way easier just to keep it all together and address your concerns about um, whatever direction you give us, and then bring back uh, the package that that has your board support. Okay. Uh, I think that that, that um, in in deference to the department, I will uh, my motion will be. Uh, to uh, defer uh, consideration of all the recommended actions and direct uh, the staff to come back with uh, revisions uh, uh, to the, the noise element uh, and ordinance uh, around uh, the following areas. Uh, one is, uh, uh, I didn't mention this earlier, but the, uh, in the definitions, we should definitely put LDN in there. We have DB in there, but we don't have LDN, and that's a, that's a big issue that we should at least describe. Uh, second, we should, um, the construction uh, hours uh, shouldn't start till eight o'clock. Uh, my, my preference and it would be eight to five on weekdays or until seven if the building official in advance has authorized such work. Um, and if the building official has authorized advanced activities, in advance activities between the hours of nine and five on Saturday, that it be allowed no more than three weeks in a row. And I, I could give you some language of this. We don't have to, uh, if, if, I'm not trying to wordsmith it here is what I'm, uh, but I'm, I'm trying to find uh, some way that uh, we take into consideration the length of the project, the impact of the project uh, on the people who live there. 
uh, that in uh, item 13.15.050 uh, to look to see if we could get a clearer language on the on the question of entertainment and and other events. Um, and I'm happy to work with you. I, again, I don't want to try to wordsmith it here. On on 13.15.060 about the air conditioning and mechanical uses uh, that uh, that I'd like to see language that deals with um, the location of these uh, uh, of these units <clears throat> in consideration of bedrooms that are on the same plane or, or, or within 50 to 100 feet. I, I, don't, I don't know exactly how to form that, but for us to be thinking about that. Um, that uh, and then that, uh, that there might be um, concurrent changes that would need to be made in the general plan element about noise based on these. I, I don't, whatever the, the full package is, so we get it correctly. I'll second that. Okay. And, and, I, and so I, I guess for clarity's sake, because we're going to defer the items, we, we want them to come back with languages, uh, a, a change in language to 13.15.040, um, and the concurrent uh, general plan uh, pieces. And there's based on the discussion we had here today at the board, if that makes sense. Ooh. Um, as, as, as part of the motion, are you continuing the public hearing? We're not closing the public hearing. We're continuing to a date certain. Yeah. Which date would you like staff to come back? Um, I don't know what the, the chair or the, or the CAO may have a better idea of what the calendar looks like, whether we could do this either on, uh, on September 10th uh, or after September 24th. I don't want to put anything September else. 10th would, would be better. The 24th is very... Uh, I don't want to do it on the 24th. Yeah. I'm, 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 well, the 10th would be better. Yeah. And I think we can get, accommodate that. If we, if we can work together September 10th. So... And so I, so I look to the clerk. Is, it, is that clearer? We're going to continue the public hearing. So we're continuing the public hearing to September 10th with changes... Thirteen point one five point zero four zero zero five zero and zero six zero and the general plan. and the and yeah needed. as needed. Also, with an understanding that when you bring it back, we don't need a whole new presentation on the airport side, right? So that it can be an abbreviated. It just focuses on specific the noise components. Thank you. Yeah. And and one last thing I'll just add, and I hope that county council will just review these sections clearly, and, and if there's any other changes that we should make uh, that clean it up, uh, that would be helpful too. We we definitely will. Yeah. Okay. So uh, we're de we're deferring this. Yeah, <laughs> we're con we're continuing it until uh, our next meeting. Sure. Um, as we don't expect any changes with the airport, it's only around the noise element. The okay. Noise so uh, I'm a little surprised that uh, do we have anybody from the airport here? Uh, we do right there. Uh, I uh, I'd, I'd like to get a comment on. The, well, we have time now till September. I, so you don't have to comment now. So we've closed comment and we're gonna. Right. Uh, That's okay. Yeah, I think it's. it's okay. There is a motion on the table. There's a motion okay. on the table. And the, the only thing I want to clarify is it says here a resolution amending. Then we're ch talking about a ordinance change. Uh, is there any conflict between the wording? A resolution and a ordinance change are two different things. They, they, they are, and because you're continuing the whole item, I anticipate that a revised resolution may be brought back depending on uh, whether it's necessary or else. And as a matter of fact, the changes that you're contemplating wouldn't require a revised resolution. The, okay. the draft resolution would be the same uh, at, the, at the next hearing. Uh, what would change would be the draft ordinances that you would- So a resolution at. is recommending, and then the change is a different thing. That's exactly yeah. right. Yeah. Okay. And the last thing I'll just add is in the future, uh, this is, um, I, I would say this is kind of like a warning um, that when we deal with the code modifications, sustainable Santa Cruz, the, that whole EIR, 
that we have so many disparate elements in it to try to mash them all together and have a clear discussion about it is very hard. And so it's gonna be important to take it in pieces that, that really make sense uh, so we can, so everybody can digest it uh, uh, well and that it, everybody's fully informed. Um, so this airport and noise regulations, while there is some tie, it would have been great to have these uh, separated. Okay, so we have a motion and we have a second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? That passes unanimously. It's now 11.05. We're gonna take a 15 minute break and come back here at 11.20 uh, to continue with items nine through 14 on our regular agenda. Uh, move to item number nine, which is to act as the uh, board of directors for the Davenport County Sanitation District. Consider approving in concept ordinance number 92 to amend title three, chapter 3.04, water service and connections of the Davenport County Sanitation District code. Approve a proposed notice of exemption from CEQA and schedule the ordinance for adoption on September 10th, 2019 as amended by the district engineer. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Ashley Trujillo. I'm the senior engineer for sanitation engineering. And um, the Davenport's recycled water plant was recently constructed and soon the recycled water will be available for commercial, residential, and agricultural use. The use of recycled water reduces demand for clean water. Therefore, it supports the county's goal for local conservation. An ordinance is required to govern the use of this recycled water. It is therefore recommended that the Board of Supervisors consider approving in concept Ordinance 92, amending the Davenport County Sanitation Code, consider approving the proposed notice of exemption from CEQA, and direct the Clerk of the Board to place Ordinance Number 92 on the next available agenda for final adoption. And I'm available to answer any questions. Are there any questions? Are there any public comments? Seeing none, I'll bring it back to the Board. I'll move the recommended action. Motion by friend, second. second by McPherson. All those in favor, please aye. say aye. 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 Opposed? That passes unanimously. Thank you for that. Uh, we will uh, continue as uh, the board of directors for the Davenport County Sanitation District and considering in um, <clears throat> Approving in concept ordinance number 91 to amend title one general provisions title three water service district and title four sewer service system various sections of the district code consider approving the notice of exemption from CEQA and schedule the ordinance for final adoption on September 10th 2019 as recommended by the district engineer. Thank you. Ordinance D91 for Davenport provides clarification on private sanitary sewer owners responsibilities to repair and maintain their private sewer system. Specifics are given for inspection and repair requirements prior to the transfer of title, and a provision has been added to allow the seller's responsibilities to be passed to the buyer. This amendment was developed based on input from realtors, plumbers, and property owners. The Santa Cruz County Sanitation District Board approved a similar amendment. Therefore, approval of this ordinance would serve to align the codes governing sewer systems within the county. It is therefore recommended that the Board of Supervisors consider and approve in concept ordinance number D91, amending the Davenport County Sanitation Code, consider approving the proposed notice of exemption from CEQA, and direct the clerk of the board to place ordinance number D91 on the next available agenda for final adoption. Thank you for that report. Are there any questions? Seeing none, is there any members of the public that like to speak to us? Seeing none, I'll close public comment. And I move for approval. All right, motion by Caput, second by Leopold. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, that passes unanimously. Moving on to item number 11, we're gonna act as the board of directors for the Freedom County Sanitation District. Consider approving in concept ordinance number F25, amending title one general provisions and title three sewer service system, various sections of the district code. Consider approving proposed notice of exemption from CEQA and schedule the ordinance for final adoption on September 10th, 2019 as recommended by the district engineer. Thank you. Ordinance F25 for Freedom is the same as the one presented for Davenport. 
And it also was developed based on the input from realtors, plumbers, and property owners. And approving this, <coughs> this amendment would align all the district codes for the county. It is therefore recommended that the Board of Supervisors consider and approve in concept ordinance number F25, amending the Freedom County Sanitation District Code, consider approving the proposed notice of exemption from CEQA and direct the clerk of the board to place ordinance F25 on the next available agenda for adoption. I'm available for questions. All right, questions, comments? Uh, so I just want to actually briefly say, because I know we've blown through these these three things very quickly, that uh, Mr. Hill actually did a significant amount of work behind the scenes to make this as easy as it is coming forward to us today. Um, two of us serve on the sanitation district. There were a lot of meetings behind the scenes, a lot of work with stakeholders, a lot of work with previous council on this. Um, and that's and we are we are we are today because your remarkable work. And I want to make sure that that got acknowledged. I just want to acknowledge that we've done some public outreach. Uh, you wrote a, a wonderful out, or an article that ran on the Aptos Times and some other locations to the degree that you, Mr. Hoppen, can continue that outreach because I think that people uh, tend to find out about this when they're about to sell their house. Unfortunately, to the degree that we can continue that outreach would be great. But I just wanted to make sure that the board was aware of how much work had happened behind the scenes because really you deserve a lot of credit for the amount of work behind the scenes. Thank you. Any public comment? Seeing none, I'll bring it back to the board for action. I'll move the recommended actions. Second. Motion by friend, second by Leopold. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? That passes unanimously. Thank you for your work. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Moving on to item number 12, to consider a report on the proposed recommendations for the recycling and solid waste strategic plan and direct public works to return by August 2020 with a progress report as outlined in a memorandum of the deputy CAO and director of public works. Good morning, Chair Coonerty and the rest of the board. My name is Casey Colossa, the Recycling and Solid Waste Service Manager for the Department of Public Works. I'm joined here today with Bo Hawksford to give you a presentation on uh, the county's recycling and solid waste services. So we'll be reviewing accomplishments from the last five years and discussing plans for the next five years going forward and providing recommendations too. So the previous plan accomplishments included uh, franchising, franchising the local waste haulers, including the um, unregulated drop box haulers and two small haulers that service the San Lorenzo Valley. Uh, we restructured the exclusive franchise uh, uh, agreement revenues. Um, we changed them from a dip disposal based uh, revenue rate model to a uh, service uh, uh, rate model, which helped improve our financial stability. Um, we completed the next generation exclusive franchise agreement with Green Waste Recovery. Um, this included um, improved provisions for bulky item collection. Um, it also included expanded organics uh, collection and included uh, funding for two outreach education coordinators. Um, we also now have better oversight of the franchise hauler activities and we've conducted audits to evaluate their recycling and diversion efforts. So uh, this graph it provides a background of why we need uh, strategic planning. Um, in 2007, we had a big drop off in disposal, which coincided kind of with the economy downturn and also um, the cities moving their waste uh, to the marina landfill. Um, this recovered in uh, 2014 as part of the economic recovery, but. Um, this shows kind of the need to have a, a more secure funding model, not based on disposal only. Um, recycling commodities markets have been on a downward trend and uh, they're no longer a re reliable source for revenue. Um, the county continues to recycle at a high rate and we anticipate this downward trend to uh, project out into the future. So going forward, um, we had uh, like a brainstorming session with our uh, solid waste uh, consultants, uh, the, the director of public works. And we, um, you know, the, the point was to identify all the decision-making factors that will, will, you know, be in our, uh, the context for our plan. So the next five-year strategy will address um, 
SB 1383 compliance. Um, that's the organic diversion requirements, including food waste. Um, it'll help identify additional revenue sources, stabilize disposal site fees, and um, sufficiently fund illegal dumping, um, litter control, and other county beautification projects and programs. Um, it'll help to maintain our existing disposal site infrastructure at the Ben Loman and uh, landfill, or Ben Loman Transfer Station, Buena Vista landfill. It'll also look at restructuring the CSA 9C um, property assessment, which hasn't been adjusted since 1995. Challenges going forward include um, the decreased market for recyclables. Um, the landfill, Buena Vista landfill is nearing closure. It's close to its, its full capacity. Um, we need to have organics diversion compliance and education outreach enforcement um, and reporting for that. And this may require more staffing. We need to talk to um, Monterey Regional Waste Management District um, so we can assure access to their facility for our disposal needs and continue exploring opportunities with the local cities, <coughs> especially regarding organics <coughs> diversion. <coughs> so we need a plan for after the Buena Vista <coughs> landfill closes. Uh, this would be a transfer station at the Buena Vista to continue to allow residents in the franchise hauler to dispose of their trash and recyclables. We aim to have this build before the landfill runs out of capacity, and this would be within a five to seven year timeline. Um, this allows us options to trickle fill the landfill or reserve space for a natural disaster. Additionally, we need to build an organics facility at the Buena Vista landfill to handle yard and wood waste and include food waste. Um, this would be processed into co compost and be marketed to the local agricultural and landscape uh, retailers. Without a um, local facility, this would require <coughs> transportation to an uh, out of county facility and, and include increased cost. So I, we discussed uh, SB 1383, the organics diversion requirements from the state. Uh, they have strict requirements, which we have to follow. And the most impactful of these is to get uh, food waste recycling down to the residential level and include in the curbside weekly pickup. So I'm gonna turn it over to Bo for more information on some of the programs and budgetary details. Thank you. <clears throat> So thank you for uh, allowing us to speak here. Um, so we've, illegal dumping is up all over the state. Uh, we've worked on addressing the issue in our franchise agreement. Uh, we allow now for three bulky item pickups that are, that are on call. Uh, you can also get four extra trash pickups or um, yard waste pickups in recycling. You can always leave a little bit extra out. Uh, we did run a illegal dumping campaign last year and we have uh, increased reporting. We've had uh, increased cooperation as well between uh, other local agencies, including the sheriff and um, other local partners as well. These are some other, other programs that we've been successful in uh, implementing um, in this county uh, are plastics bags bans uh, we've also been successful with our Sharps and Meds Take Back program. Uh, and recently, we've, um, we've created an ordinance to help with the hotel motel industry uh, in curbing their use of single-use single plastics and in, in having them have refillable uh, containers for things such as shampoos, uh, which will uh, drastically help improve um, the rate of which we're disposing of single-use plastics. Um, state also modeled some legislation after this, and uh, our ordinance, as you know, will take effect in 2021. The states will take effect in 2023. Uh, other potential programs to further reduce the use of single-use plastics 
uh, are, are gonna be necessary in the future, uh, as well as other um, problem products such as batteries and solar panels. So this, this is our operating cost. You can see that we've had significant increase in costs over the last uh, few years. Since 2012, we've had uh, almost a 40% increase. And a lot of the drivers of this has, you know, has to do with the loss of the recycling markets, uh, increased labor costs, uh, another, another indicator that it, it's gonna get worse before it gets better is the fact that aluminum, which has been a steady uh, commodity in this in this area is actually been on the decline and it looks like it's going to be declining into the near as far as costs in the next couple of years um, some other issues is are that we we need to stay competitive with our tipping rates um, but reasonable because the higher there's a correlation between higher tipping rates and an increased illegal dumping as well uh, so we have to make sure there, there's a there's a there's a there's a point in which we can raise them too high uh, at the face of the landfill. Uh, so we, again, do need to work on uh, a more sustainable um, source of revenue that is equitable throughout the whole community. Uh, another issue is just some unfunded state mandates that are coming down the pike, uh, including uh, SB 1383, uh, which uh, even though the state does say that there's not gonna be uh, any any costs associated uh, at the state level, that may be true, but at the uh, local level, it's not true at all. There's gonna be a significant increase in costs uh, and possibly some um, increase in labor as well. Uh, I threw this in there um, because this is, we, we recently procured uh, some new equipment. Uh, this actually is, what you're looking at is a picture of all of our mechanics and uh, maintenance workers out at the landfill and in front of it, they're standing in front of our new hybrid, it's a hybrid electric diesel. Uh, so we are working towards greening our fleet uh, as we do make some procurement choices. <coughs> some non-disposal operating costs. Uh, these, these, are, these are important programs uh, that, that benefit all of us, that benefits the community uh, they do take, I mean, they do take away from our operating costs, however. Uh, we have, we, while we have increased operating costs, we still have to um, make sure that we're cleaning up where the community actually sees what we're doing. Um, these, these funds, however, we can, we can raise these costs even higher and we'll, we'll, we'll use all the money is what I'm trying to say. There's never enough. Um, some non-disposal operating costs uh, more are, are, this is for our long range planning. Um, we need to plan for the inevitability of change. Uh, I know we've taught, you've heard the magic landfill. Uh, however, we don't have another space to dig another hole. Uh, there's only, there really is last aerial survey, there's 10 to 12 years left uh, at our current rate of disposal. The more we can divert and get more things out of the landfill, uh, we will be able to extend that. Uh, one way we're, that we're, we're doing that is also to, uh, uh, for every three days that we're able to transfer um, from Ben Loman directly to Marina, which we, we do for every three days, it, it keeps one day of airspace at the, at the landfill. Uh, we, we also do educate um, and promote zero waste principles via vis-a-vis -vis the green, vis excuse me, green business and green schools programs. Uh, this is the best way to help to educate the, the public by reaching out to them when they're young and as well as uh, giving economic incentives for showing that you can save money by having um, uh, less, re less relying on um, more less, la less long lasting uh, light bulbs and things of this nature. Uh, so these are our critical capital needs for the foreseeable future. Um, we've, we've identified, we have current annual costs. Sorry. I skipped one, sorry. Um, let me back up a, a second. Uh, so the average life of, of equipment is approximately 10, 10 years. Um, we have been working towards a more sustainable replacement fund for this equipment. Uh, and, and building up some of our reserves so that when the equipment is at its end of the life, we'll, we'll, we won't have to bond 
or uh, go out for a loan so much. Um, we have some big, big costs coming up. Uh, our organics facility uh, will cost approximately $12 million. Um, we might have some savings. We're currently in the design phase uh, and we're looking at locating a facility at the Buena Vista landfill, um, which could reduce that cost. Um, we have storm, ongoing stormwater improvement issues as well. And um, we're also working towards a transfer station at Buena Vista, which uh, we're looking at in the tune of $17.5 million. Uh, we currently um, have about seven and a half million dollars saved in our closure fund, which is mandated by the state. And we're, um, we're in compliance with that. Now I can go on to this. Um, this, this does show our long, our long, our critical capital needs for the next for foreseeable future. Um, we're currently, uh, as you can see, we do have some current annual costs associated with some of these. And as we move forward with some of the bigger ticket items, uh, there will be uh, additional uh, future additional annual costs associated with bond payments. And uh, it will more than <coughs> triple the amount of our bond payments uh, once we go forward with those purchases. And this, this is a graph that explains um, a, a need for the uh, more sustainable um, revenue source. The, at the current, with the, with the fall of the recycling market, we're not getting as much revenue. Uh, with increased diversion programs, we don't get as much at the tipping face as well. And with that, it, we, just, we get a gap that creates a shortfall for our future needs. And this is the second half of our brainstorming um, meeting. These are, you saw the, the issues that are in front of us and these are some uh, more solution oriented uh, uh, issues that we can, we're working towards helping, have, helping to solve those issues. And now we'll move on to some recommendations over the next five years. Um, and going into the future and some of the issues that we're working on. So infrastructure development, um, like as I was stating, uh, we are in the design phase currently of building an organic processing facility, which will include uh, <coughs> food waste as well. Uh, we also hope to begin building that transfer station uh, within the next six to seven years uh, so that by the time it's built, we'll still have a few years left at the Buena Vista landfill. And as Casey was stating, we would work on trickle filling it to uh, prolong the, the closure. However, um, it, it, would, it would just, we'd probably have, uh, we haven't decided yet, but we'll, we'll probably be working with just having our hauler dump in the, in the, in the landfill and uh, the self haulers will be able to use the transfer station until it's full. We have, um, so in programs and operations, we have two new program coordinators that started back in January, and they've been key in helping to educate the businesses and the public about upcoming uh, uh, third <coughs> requirements with food waste. Um, and just to put it out there of why it's important we start educating now, starting in 2024, the state will be issuing fines for non-compliance and contamination. So funding, um, so we, we do need an equitable source of funding. Uh, and as your board uh, has, has said, when we came, brought you our franchise agreement um, with those three years of 12 and a half percent increases, uh, we, you know, we, we, we did say that we're not gonna come back to increase rates and we'd like to stick with that. Uh, there is an equitable way of spreading the cost amongst every um, person that benefits from the landfill and transportation. And that is to do an adjustment with the CSA 9C. Uh, this would be the most equitable um, way to spread, spread this cost throughout the county. Um, and if we were to just raise, continually raise rates, uh, it, would only, it would only affect those people that are customers of green waste, which um, they'd be subsidizing the people that do actually still use the landfill. Uh, so we find that it would be most equitable to, to work on 9C. 
Um, and policy, so as mentioned, um, the more we divert, the, the more airspace we have, um, but also as a county policy uh, and, and part of our strategic plan, we, we are working towards um, reducing greenhouse emissions and reducing plastic <coughs> pollution. Uh, we do need to further expand on policies that shift the diver burden of diversion onto manufacturers with certain problem materials as, such as batteries and solar panels as mentioned. Uh, we also need to continue to implement policies to be compliant with SB 1383, uh, which will continue to improve our stormwater compliance uh, uh, as well. Uh, we, we also will be continuing to work with our local and regional partners uh, to continually improve uh, uh, local issues, including illegal dumping. And with that, um, I, oops, I open it up to questions. Thank you. Sure. Supervisor McPherson. You know, to begin with, I, I hate that term unfunded mandates because there's, from past experience, there's no good ending to it. Uh, and somebody uh, pays the price and we do it at the beginning, but uh, thankfully the state has come back and done that recently, but um, it just doesn't make any sense. Uh, but I'm speaking from the county up to the state, uh, probably thought otherwise before, but, uh, but I, I am glad that we're thinking and have continued to, or have uh, an ongoing uh, thought about and strategically addressing uh, the future waste management needs of our lifespan of our li landfill that never seems to end, but it, it is out there now. <coughs> I'm, I'm particularly concerned about recycling services and would like to see the state provide some solutions for how local communities can adapt to the collapse in the market. I think this is, needs to be addressed in a statewide manner. Um, we've seen, I've seen, we've seen uh, two recycling centers in my district, uh, CRV centers close in Felton and Boulder Creek uh, just this last July, uh, as is the case of many of those centers throughout the state. Uh, and now many of the privately run CRV services are going away too, as we've just read about in the last few weeks. Um, there are many people who rely on uh, CRV, or CRV for extra re income, but we know that uh, many retailers uh, would struggle to offer this service if, uh, even though they are required to by law, which is kind of uh, interesting in itself as well. And the fines for those merchants uh, pose a big burden for especially the small stores. Um, I know that our public work staff has uh, been in touch with Cal Recycle on a regular basis, but I think a letter from this board uh, to head to the head of the uh, Cal Recycle will underline how important uh, it is for us to see a statewide solution to this. And uh, there, I'm sure there's gonna be similar a discussion to follow, but, uh, and I would be glad to make a motion, but uh, to move this recommended action, but I'll wait for other comments uh, with an additional direction that we have the chair uh, write a letter on behalf of the board uh, to Cal Recycle, uh, copying our state representatives in the legislature to request a statewide recycling, recycling and CRV solution through legislation or other means. Um, this has got to be addressed uh, statewide and uh, we ought to get right on it right now. Um, we do have some lead time, which is good, and I'm glad to see your thorough uh, thoughts on this. Uh, and I'm, uh, it's a problem that's in five years is gonna be right in front of us, uh, but it's facing us today. So uh, thank you for your input and uh, a reality check, um, but I'm just really hopeful that the state will take some action. I think that's where the decision has to be made and not with more un unfunded mandates. Supervisor Cabot. Sure. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for the the time and effort and everything put into this. Uh, <clears throat> the only complaint I have is uh, rather than being proactive a few years back, uh, where it seems like now we're reacting and we're almost uh, in a, uh, like uh, we've got to do something now or we're really, you know, we're really in trouble. I think we've seen this coming for many years, but uh, anyway, we're, we're finally dealing with it. Now with the shelf life of uh, Buena Vista landfill, <clears throat> I've talked to people, if we do this right, instead of 10 to 12 years, uh, 
where it would have to be another site or something else, uh, we could actually maybe stretch that out to 20 years. Is that correct or not? If we do the recycling and uh, the organics and everything and the plastics, if, if we get this right, how much more shelf life are we giving to the uh, Buena Vista? I don't have an exact number on that, but definitely that's the goal is to divert as much material away from the landfill and the result of that will be extending the, the useful life of that landfill. Um, you know, right now projected capacity is another 10 to 12 years. Um, but we could definitely increase that by the removal of food waste and maybe other plastic items and hard to recycle things that uh, currently go <coughs> into the landfill. The importance of this would be if if we have, like we were talking earlier about the airport, people and noise and things like that, uh, moving a dump site would be a huge neighborhood battle, no matter where you're thinking of putting it. So uh, the, the longer we can keep uh, Buena Vista going, the less urgent it is to you know, have to find another site. So it's very important. Uh, <clears throat> now, <clears throat> most of my neighbors that I see and most of the people I know, uh, residents are very good about putting recycle and uh, garbage in different containers. I, I haven't seen one for organics, so that would be a lot of food waste and things like that. So I don't know how you can have the household not put the organic in the uh, uh, garbage unless they have a composter in the backyard or something like that. Is that the answer to it? Yeah, we would certainly want to encourage uh, at-home composting, but our thought is we would have uh, residential customers put their food <coughs> waste into the yard waste bin um, yeah. It wouldn't be an extra cart, it'd be collected with the yard waste, um, and both of those materials together could be composted. Yeah, the only problem, uh, problem I have with the composter in our backyard is the raccoons. So, uh, but anyway, other than that, it, it does work really well. Um, to me, the biggest problem we're having is, uh, I'll go to uh, a fad, fast food, place we can we can name endless fast food chains and everything goes in their garbage uh you go with uh these uh some of it is recyclable some of it isn't the lid is not recyclable so then we're getting to the fact of if the distributor gives them something that's recyclable then we could have separate we could require fast food chains to have separate sites for dumping either something recyclable or not. And then the same would be true with organics. We're talking about tons of stuff that will come out of a fast food uh, hamburger or coffee or whatever uh, uh, establishment. So we're, we're dealing with that because that's the biggest problem that I see. Uh, yes, yeah, certainly um, to go food, uh, to go serviceware, we have an ordinance in place, the acceptable environmentally, environmentally acceptable packaging ordinance, uh, which uh, requires the to go uh, serviceware to be either compostable or recyclable. We'd like to switch that more to compostable type of, uh, you know, plateware, na napkins, so forth. So all that that formerly went in the trash could go into like the food waste uh, bin and, and, and be taken as food waste and composted. <clears throat> I, I guess what, what is alarming to me that the fast food chains, uh, you almost have to tell them that they have to do it because they don't cooperate on their own. They've seen this coming for a long time. And uh, uh, they account for a lot of a lot of the stuff going into the Buena Vista landfill. Uh, <clears throat> and especially organics. Now the organics actually will break down uh, and that's not really, if we do separate the organics, that's actually gonna be a plus to uh, Buena Vista, correct? Correct. Yeah. Uh, just a side note, I know somebody, people in Watsonville, the coffee grounds 
at all the coffee places, that's good for your garden. And they, some people will go there and they'll ask them to, you know, save the coffee grounds and they go dump it in their garden. But uh, again, that comes down to the fast food chain, whether or not they'll cooperate. <clears throat> um, let's see. Uh, okay, on paper recycling, uh, I think we need to look at, I know in uh, District 4, with bingo, uh, uh, if they separate the paper from the garbage, uh, the paper is all recyclable from the bingo now. Uh, they don't have the old cards, they have paper throwaways. So, uh, in just by letting people know that uh, the two bingo sites in Watsonville area, uh, they're saving, uh, one is uh, at the church site, and they're saving about $700 a month in what used to go in the garbage and what now goes into the recyclable. That's a, re a very good incentive to whoever has the uh, site. Uh, if we can get that out in the other areas of the Santa Cruz County, that they'll actually save money by reducing the dumping of their regular garbage and increasing their recyclable. So we're not talking about raising the price on recycling, uh, are we? Is that part of this? Are, are we going to charge more money for recycling than we did in the past? No, but we definitely we want to consider all the waste streams, the recyclable materials, the stuff that has to currently go to landfill, the stuff that gets composted. Um, we can't just all base our revenue on what goes in the landfill. That was our current rate model. We want to address kind of the whole service, like the stuff you have to recycle and divert <coughs> may require, you know, to be a source of revenue yes. to help pay for that service because it doesn't make enough <coughs> money to support itself. Yeah, and it, it comes down to having enough containers for the public to be able to put it in one container for recycle at these uh, different sites and also put it in the garbage area. Uh, an example of that would be uh, the city of Watsonville, Scotts Valley, Capitola, Santa Cruz. <coughs> when they rent out a facility, <coughs> there's a cleaning deposit. But I, and people are very good about getting their uh, deposit back. I think a problem that I've seen in the South County is when they do the cleaning, they don't have a clear idea of where to put the recycle and where to put the garbage. So let's say they have a wedding, uh, they have a quinceanera, they have uh, uh, some kind of a rental. If we can, if we can somehow make sure that uh, and the cities will cooperate, I'm sure. But when somebody is doing a cleanup to get their deposit, it's very clear that they're told that uh, please put everything in the recycle and then please put the garbage in something else. Yeah. I just wanted to speak to that real quick. Uh, so we did hire a couple of program coordinators. They are going out to the businesses to educate them on uh, all that's going to be re is currently required of them and what will be required of them in the future uh, to address those exact types of issues. You know, actually, you're right. I want to thank you. Uh, about four years ago, we did it in South County with the, uh, what I'm talking about. We don't have that many places, but it was your department that came out and actually talked to the public and said, this is what we're going to do, and talked to the church that owned the you know site or even the city that owned the site uh, when they rented out. So... Uh, yeah, a lot of it is uh, the public's not aware. Right. So, thank you. Right. Thank you. <coughs> Supervisor Leopold. Thank you, Chair. I'll try to be brief. Um, the, uh, I, I appreciate the presentation. There are, these are big issues that we will be facing. Um, I was wondering, you talked about uh, being sensitive to tipping costs versus uh, uh, increases in illegal dumping. What do you do? Uh, how do you determine what that price point sensitivity is? Good question. Um, 
we've there's there are studies that are 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 done that conduct that have conducted when when the point when illegal dumping starts increasing, um, it it actually kind of I've noticed a correlation. I, I help manage the illegal dumping program, so I've seen a correlation almost at the beginning of every year uh, when we do increase our rates of a slight uptick in illegal dumping. Uh, then it levels out it's, uh, once people get adjusted to it. But I think that if you were to if you have small incremental increases that people can expect, like based on CPI every year, that's one thing. But if you were to go forward with a rate increase of the size that we need to 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 fund these unfunded mandates, um, it, we'd see a huge, people would either go to Marina or and we'd lose all revenue, or we'd and probably we'd see a much larger increase in um, the illegal dumping. At what point do I think that that would occur? I, I, I'd have to get back to you on that. I, I'm not sure of uh, at what cost people is just too much for people. Um, I think small, I mean, we, we hear complaints about small incremental increases of, of a dollar, um, but it, again, it levels out. Sure. Yeah, well, I think it's obviously something you wanna keep uh, uh, track of. Um, in the in the uh, presentation, you also talked that we spend over two hundred thousand dollars on street sweeping, um, and I'm wondering, is that a? How do we run that program? Um, is is there beyond construction sites? How, who gets the, those services? Well, we're we're mandated for stormwater, uh, for stormwater um, compliance, and. So we have different routes that they go on to make sure that the, the, that the, that the leaves and there's not much anything in the gutters to make sure that's, that keeps our stormwater um, clean enough to be in compliance with the state, state um, regulations. Uh, it's also based on, uh, we get, if we get, it's driven by complaints to, to us as well. If there's um, an area that hasn't been swept in a while and it's backing up, we'll, we'll get out there. Um, it's, we, we mainly keep the program running on the, on the main arterial roads. Uh, so you won't necessarily see a lot of street sweeping on, on just your small ro local roads. Um, but the main driver of, of the street sweeping program is due to this, the stormwater regulations. Yeah, I just, uh, I've lived in my house uh, 26 years. It's only once that I can remember a street sweeper coming by. Um, and I don't think that unusual. I didn't, you know, I didn't, I don't see the, I, I haven't thought of the county of having a street sweeping program. So it was a surprise when I saw the street sweeper, but there was no notification to people in advance. So there were lots of parked cars and it was a lot less effective. Um, and I'm just wondering if we have a program and we could say, we're gonna, we're gonna be in your neighborhood or we're, we're gonna be in this part of town or whatever that is. Um, it, it seems to me that you could get, do a better job of street, street sweeping. We can work on that internally to yeah. work on a program that kind of like they have up in the, you know, Berkeley in the East Bay areas where you can't park your car on one side of the street would, would probably be um, welcome. Yeah. Um, the, 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 the bigger issue here obviously is how do we pay for uh, both the mandated uh, new responsibilities that we're gonna have uh, and just the ongoing um, upkeep of our infrastructure, uh, be it equipment and the landfill. And I guess it's really a question for our CAO um, in terms of, uh, I don't think we could answer it here today, but I think it would be helpful for us to look at our uh, debt capacity and how many different departments have interest in being part of some new debt issuance. Uh, I can think of at least three departments that are you know, sort of counting on um, uh, some of our debt capacity to make infrastructure investments. And I don't, and we've never really had a conversation about um, what's the vision for that and how, and, and how we're gonna manage that. But when you hear about $17 million facilities or, or, or uh, new jail space or n uh, new juvenile hall or n new uh, health uh, pieces and the housing that we wanna do on our sites, there, I can see that debt capacity going away pretty quickly. And I, I just think it would be good for us to have a, a plan or at least start talking about it so we know what kind of choices we're making and, and also departments to know where, where those l limits might be. Yes, I agree. And um, 
part of our facilities master planning process, we actually are conducting uh, an analysis of our debt capacity right now. And so when we do have that analysis, we will come before the board and share it with you and talk about the needs of the county and the different options we have. Yeah, I think that's critical because we, we can be proud that we're reducing our, our debt um, over the next 10 years. Uh, and we do have to make investments in our infrastructure, but uh, there's a limit to that, obviously. Um, and I just want to go into it with eyes wide open rather than we need to do it and we got to issue debt. Um, and you know, it's nice that we're, that, uh, that we're not looking to the green waste fees as a way to pay for this 9C to the average person's pocketbook though. It's, it, it, it's more money out of the pocket. And so uh, being thoughtful about that uh, and making sure it doesn't tip the, the scales uh, will be important. Do you have an idea of a timeline of about when you'd be talking about this? We've, we've been talking about it for a while internally um, with our consultants HF and H who are here to answer any questions as well. Uh, we, we've, we started this process of studying 9C and um, bringing it uh, into the, you know, it, it's been grandfathered pre Prop 218. So yeah. we're, we've been studying it and, and we, we had to stop uh, for a variety of reasons, and we have been given the okay to start studying it again, and to uh, we can probably have it to your board. We're we're looking at maybe uh, early next year. Yeah. Well, I think uh, uh, I'm not rushing to uh, raise uh, fees, uh, but I I want to get some sense as to when we're going to be talking about that. So if the first quarter or second quarter of next year, that that seems like a reasonable time. Okay, great. Is there any public comment about this item? All right, seeing none, there's no recommended action. So I wanna thank you for your, uh, thank you for your work on this. It's obviously a key issue and we look forward to hearing updates as we go forward. Uh, Mr. Chair, I, I wonder if um, under the circumstances though for the board to express its concerns about this, if we shouldn't, um, write a letter uh, to uh, the chair of uh, Cal Recycle and our legislative representatives about our concerns, um, you know, what, what, uh, of bringing this uh, to fruition, you know, and what challenges it, it has. I'd, I'd like to direct sure. the, the board to um, ask the chair to write a letter. <laughs> that, that, to Can we take action? Can we take action? Yeah. <laughs> Your own rules allow you to add things to your agenda. Um, I think this is fine. Okay, great. So, uh, so motion, yeah. direct the chair to write a letter to Cal Recycle. And state representatives um, about our concerns. Let me just ask a curiosity question. What happens to a battery when it uh, ends up at the I'll right second site? Chair. Okay, well, Supervisor but we got a motion and a second on the floor. So let's, Excuse me, I Chair. think there is action on this item. It's to direct public works to return with the report back. Okay. So you can add it to this then. So let's, so is that okay to, to add that? So that will. The recommended actions recommended and action the letter. And plus a letter to Cal Recycle with our state legislators. Okay, so we got a motion and a second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, that passes unanimously. But uh, you'll tell me later on. Yeah. Okay. All right, um, moving on to item number 13, is to consider a final appointment of Captain Craig Kunstler to the Emergency Medical Care Commission as the at-large representative of Santa Cruz County Law Enforcement Chief Association for a term to expire April 1st, 2023. Move to approve. Second. Motion is second and seeing no public comment, bring it back to the board. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, that passes unanimously. Uh, item number 14, to consider final appointment of Robin McIntyre to the uh, Emergency Medical Care Commission as an at-large representative of consumers for a term to expire April 1st, 2023. Uh, and seeing no public comment, bring Move it back to, to the board. Motion by Leopold, second by Friend. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Uh, we'll now move into closed session. Will there be any reportable action? No. All right. 